Despite my borderline social disorder and the fact that I missed one grade in elementary school because of the neighborhood I lived in and the school I went to, I kept up when it came to intimate parenting. I lived in an area that belongs to the lower middle class. I don't know if it's because of this or not, but there were a lot of beautiful women my age. During college, I only lived at home because one of the top five engineering universities in the world was only a 10-minute drive from my house. I helped active women in my area with their studies by helping them with their homework, taking home tests, and teaching them various subjects in high school and community college. In return, I received advice on issues in bed. This exchange resulted in a high level of intimate satisfaction for both me and the women between the ages of 18 and 21 whom I mentored. I received a lot of recommendations because I was known as a patient, reserved, and intelligent person. I was able to find a common language with my friends on an intellectual level, which made it easier for them to understand the subjects in which I helped them. In intimate moments, I always treated them with kindness and respect, and never disclosed the details of our meetings to anyone else, although I suspect they may have shared them with each other. During this time, I had intimate relationships with 11 women, many of whom I met several times. Although I have never had a romantic relationship with any of them, the dynamics between us were purely transactional. The exchange of information took place in my interests. Only one woman who bore the street name Jezebel, not her real name, stood out during this time. Despite the fact that I did not show her the proper gentleness, it was not due to a lack of desire to be kind. Jezebel is my age, a tall and strong girl and she was not overweight. Most of the excess weight was made up of her upper torso, as well as her muscular thighs. Although her face was unremarkable, those who knew her, including me, believed that she possessed a body akin to that of Aphrodite. Anyone who doesn't like petite women would consider Jezebel's figure to be perfect. She was very seductive, enjoyed her intimate life, and easily attracted partners. In addition to her athletic physique, she participated in numerous softball and basketball leagues. Although she was not the most educated person, she was far from stupid and had greater ambitions than many in our society. Her main goal was to create her own studio or website for adults. I provided her with tutoring services, mainly in math and business skills, to help her achieve this goal. Jezebel confessed to me, and I believed her, that I was the only person she allowed to have an unprotected intimate relationship with her, because she was sure that I did not have sexually transmitted diseases, regardless of my efforts. She seemed to enjoy the experience. Regardless of whether she was pretending at the moment of climax or experiencing the real effect, she always let out a primal scream and assured me afterwards that it was amazing. Jezebel was the only woman I knew who didn't ask me for some academic favor before sleeping with me. I clearly remember those six times when we were close, and they left a lasting impression on my social clumsiness. One evening she unexpectedly called me and offered to have a good time in bed. In response, I immediately went to her apartment, and she of course was not indifferent. Although I never fell in love with Jezebel, she was very dear to me, and I was ready to do anything for her, even without expecting anything in return. In my senior year of college, I created a high-tech and encrypted proximity sensor that could be easily programmed. Similar to the Easy Pass system used on toll roads in the United States, my invention was specifically designed for secure systems. Various versions of my sensors have been used by corporations with their own systems, numerous government agencies at both the state and federal levels, as well as the military. In order to participate in patenting my own inventions, I had to get a security clearance. My inventions generated significant profits through patent royalties, which allowed me to create two companies to market products and develop new products. Lacking managerial skills and focusing solely on invention and design, I instructed my lawyers to create various shell and holding corporations to control the activities of my companies. I have retained ownership of the shares of the main holding company. To get to the truth, you need to have a high level of sophistication and spend a lot of time, 
I have never used my tangled network of companies to evade taxes. However, some of them were strategically located offshore to hide my property. Only the CEOs and finance directors of my two operating companies knew that I had supreme power. To everyone else, I presented myself as just a hired head of the new product development department at one of the operating companies. By the age of 24, I had laid all the necessary foundations and was ready for a relationship with a woman. But my path was not easy due to borderline social anxiety and the fact that I no longer used my intelligence to attract partners. Despite all these obstacles, I stubbornly tried to make acquaintances by visiting various online platforms and social gatherings. Finally, at the age of 26, I met one special girl, Allison. She was undoubtedly the most attractive woman who ever reciprocated my romantic feelings. Not only did she have a beautiful face, but she also had an amazing figure. Looking back at our rather ordinary courtship, I realized that it was more superficial than I thought before. I was so fascinated by her appearance, especially her impressive qualities, that I did not notice some of the qualities that are usually appreciated in a partner. Throughout our relationship, one thing that caught my eye was her complete disinterest in my work. She never showed curiosity or asked about her. Allison seemed uninterested and pretended not to understand anything when I mentioned my job, showing a complete lack of curiosity. Surprisingly, her lack of interest became her advantage when it came to the prenuptial agreement. Gail, a respected lawyer who helped me create corporations, strongly recommended that I sign a prenuptial agreement. Despite my hesitation, Gail made it clear that she would no longer work with me if I did not present the prenuptial agreement to Allison before the wedding. Gail drew up a simple prenuptial agreement that excluded from common ownership any shares, interests, or royalties related to companies or patents owned by one of the parties in the amount of more than 10% on the date of marriage or acquired during marriage. Allison asked her father to review the document, after which she signed it without hesitation. The intimate relationship between Allison and me has always been satisfying. After two and a half years of marriage, we were expecting our first child. During a spontaneous visit to my parents, I unexpectedly met Jezebel on the street. We decided to meet for a cup of coffee, and I was pleasantly surprised to see that she, as always, looks amazing. She talked enthusiastically about her latest project, and I couldn't help but admire her confidence and style. Despite my offer to buy my parents a new house in a more elite area, they preferred to stay in their friendly village with numerous friends. Meeting Jezebel and having a cup of coffee with her made my quick visit even more memorable. I told her a familiar story about a job for hire. Jezebel was in the process of creating an adult website, but ran into financial difficulties. After asking her delicately about the situation, I found out that she only needs another $25,000 to successfully launch the site. I promised to meet her again at the coffee shop in a week, at the same time, and mentioned that I might be able to introduce her to the investor. Jezebel was delighted at the prospect, hugged me warmly, and kissed me on the cheek as I left. I've been thinking about this for a week. $25,000 seemed insignificant to me, and although the business she was interested in was questionable, I liked her anyway. A week later we met again, and she looked even more stunning than before. She was dressed more provocatively, emphasizing her flawless figure, which I had the pleasure of observing back in my student years. At the same time, her face and hair looked even more radiant than before. As soon as the coffee was placed in front of us, I handed her an envelope with $25,000 in cash. Jezebel was stunned, tears streaming down her face. I've never seen her like this, given her rugged appearance. Then she offered me to become the owner of the site, but I refused, insisting that money is a gift without any conditions. Then she made a tempting offer, running her hand over my thigh and promising to make love to me like never before. I think that with her determination and physique, she would have fulfilled her promise. But at that moment, I respectfully refused, expressing my love for my wife instead. When we were saying goodbye, Jezebel with tears in her eyes remarked, 
your wife is very lucky. But she offered her help anyway, to which I replied, just be successful. Despite the fact that I felt a little awkward during the hug, I quickly stopped hugging, feeling out of place. Jezebel was kind enough not to mention it. Allison and I had two more children, a daughter, Whitney, and then a son, Jerry. Although I didn't name Whitney after Jezebel, I agreed with my wife when she suggested the name. Although my intimate relationship with Allison remained satisfactory, I gradually noticed her superficiality and materialistic tendencies. Despite this, I appreciated her for her other positive qualities and for the fact that she was the only woman I had ever loved. And most importantly, she gave me three wonderful children. Amber was one of them. At the center of this narrative was a 12-year-old girl who possessed the beauty of her mother and the best qualities of Allison and me. She had intelligence on par with mine, achieving the same level of genius in tests, but at the same time surpassing me in social skills. At the age of 10, Whitney also boasted a striking appearance, although she inherited some of my less remarkable features. Anyway, she was distinguished by kindness, compassion, and empathy, standing out as the most caring person I have ever met. She possessed a radiant presence, capable of illuminating any room she entered. She was not only beautiful, but also incredibly smart. Jerry, on the other hand, was an energetic and cheerful boy. It was obvious that he had inherited his athleticism from Allison. I tried to learn about baseball and basketball so that I could have meaningful conversations with him about his favorite sports. Despite his athleticism, Jerry was always kind-hearted, never spoke ill of others and was always in a good mood. He had a strong relationship with his sisters, and they all got along harmoniously with each other. Despite having wonderful children, it can be assumed that I consider Allison an excellent mother. But it wasn't like that. Our main differences arose due to differences in parenting styles. I couldn't pinpoint the exact reason for this. Maybe it was just jealousy, but Allison's relationship with Amber was strained. She was too strict, and her remarks were sometimes harsh. I have repeatedly come across the fact that Allison often mistreated Amber. It has reached a breaking point. By the time Amber turned 12, it became clear that she would only go anywhere with her mother in my presence. This became a serious problem when one summer Allison wanted to take the children to the lake house for a week, and I had to work. It took all my persuasion skills to persuade Amber to go on this trip, and I had to have a serious conversation with Allison to make sure she would be kind to Amber during the holidays. Although Allison had the best relationship with Whitney and Jerry, she still had her moments with them. Despite the fact that Allison was a stay-at-home mother, I spent as much time with the children as she did. She always had some classes, so the time I spent with them was usually more meaningful. Having been married for about 15 years, having three wonderful children and a wife I cared about very much, I was driving home from the airport after a one-night business trip. It was about one o'clock in the afternoon, despite the fact that I had informed Allison of my entire route. I called the family last night, but Allison didn't seem interested in our conversation, and I wasn't sure if she would be home when I arrived. I was looking forward to the opportunity to be intimate before the children returned from school at 3.30 p.m. When I stopped at the sign to turn onto my street, I noticed a familiar car passing by, a red Roger Mayberry Corvette, behind the wheel of which he was clearly visible. He turned the dial on the radio, and music blared from the speakers installed in Roger Mayberry's car. He was one of the best sellers in my company, specializing in the sale of military products. Despite the fact that he was not an engineer, he was well-versed in our technologies and had a natural charm, thanks to which he coped with his duties perfectly. Like all our employees, he had a high-level clearance, even higher than most, due to the sensitivity of the military application of our products. I asked why Roger was here at this hour. I asked myself naively. Living on a driveway, it never occurred to me that he could be in my house just two blocks away from me. I was wondering what reason could have brought him to this part of the city. In a matter of minutes, I got to my front door, 
entered the house, and did not find Allison on the ground floor. I went up the grand staircase which Allison adored and insisted on, to the second floor. The sound of my shoes on the marble floor of the hallway echoed loudly. As I approached the entrance to the bedroom, a sultry voice called, Did you forget something, Raj? Or did you decide to make another deposit? Startled, I entered the room and saw Allison lying on her back, naked. When she noticed me, her smile turned into misery, and she half screamed, Oh, Brian, I'm so sorry. Unfortunately, in a split second, my brain processed the situation, and a whirlwind of emotions swept through my head. Anger, disgust, anxiety, hatred, and fear. I froze, mouth agape, as all these feelings merged into one irresistible sensation. A heavy cloud of sadness enveloped me, causing me to stumble a few steps before everything went dark and I woke up in the hospital. The monitor signaled to the infirmary that I was awake, and a moment after I opened my eyes, a nurse ran into the room. Soon the doctor came in after her. How are you feeling, Mr. Banks? Asked a kind nurse named Nancy. It's like my head is being squeezed, I moaned. We are very glad that you woke up so quickly, she exclaimed, checking my indicators on a nearby monitor. Why am I in the hospital and how did I get here? I asked when the doctor came into the room. Hello, Mr. Banks. I'm Dr. Petra. A female doctor from India greeted me warmly. Let me look at your eyes before answering your questions, she said, and Nurse Nancy took my wrist. Dr. Petra took a light source out of her pocket and carefully examined my eyes, carefully pushing the eyelids and the skin around the eyeballs apart. After a thorough examination, Dr. Petra stood up, and Nurse Nancy released my wrist. They both smiled, and Dr. Petra informed me that I had a concussion. According to my wife, I tripped in the bedroom, fell backwards on the marble floor in the hallway, and hit my head on the floor. Although I could have died, my vital signs were normal, and the concussion was most likely not as serious as it seemed at first. At the memory of what caused the fall, a wave of sadness swept over me. My eyes widened and I let out a loud groan, feeling sick. Fortunately, Nurse Nancy worked quickly and managed to place the container under my chin in time. Although it was an unconventional vomit bag, the contents of my stomach got into it during vomiting, mostly bile, since I didn't have lunch that day. Having completely emptied my stomach, I leaned back in my chair, and Nancy applied a cold compress to my head. Dr. Petra then performed another examination and expressed surprise at my vomiting suggesting that it might indicate a more serious concussion than initially thought, despite the absence of other symptoms. Maybe my immediate reaction was triggered by the memory of the emotional shock that led to my fall, I asked, perfectly understanding the likely answer. Yes, that's a plausible explanation, Dr. Petra said, stroking her chin. Have you experienced a similar crisis? Yes, I replied abruptly. I didn't handle my emotions very well when I realized that my wife had cheated on me, I added with a snort. After a short pause, I felt proud that I had not resorted to swearing in my outburst. But there was still a hint of worry in me. My doctors looked shocked, but I couldn't resist adding a little sarcasm when I asked about my wife. Nancy explained that she had gone to pick up our children from school. Looking at my watch, I realized it was 3.28 so she was probably picking them up at that moment. Then Dr. Petra asked about my recent diet. Petra was looking at me with concern written all over her face. No, since about eight in the morning, I replied. Dr. Petra advised me, since your vomiting seems to be caused by emotions and not a concussion, I strongly recommend that you eat something, especially before your wife returns with the children. I hesitated. Do you think I'll throw up again when I see her? Dr. Petra reassured me. No, I don't think so. Then she ordered Nurse Nancy. Please ask the kitchen to bring a bowl of oatmeal immediately. I want oatmeal with cinnamon and raisins, without brown sugar, I said to Nancy with a smile. The oatmeal arrived five minutes later. I ate quickly and was already starting to feel a little better when Nancy returned to my room and announced that I had company. Three of my beloved children rushed to me, each of them trying to get to me first. 
I laughed and warned them not to touch my head or neck. Trying to hug all three of them with both hands, I listened to them all talking at the same time. I couldn't help but giggle, although laughing at the top of my voice would probably hurt too much. My physical and emotional state was in complete disarray, but the sight of the children lifted my spirits. I was so engrossed in our conversation that I almost didn't notice Allison standing next to me. Amber's tear-stained face brightened, and the other two were beaming with joy. Allison's expression, as she watched our conversation, was mixed, funny and confused. I tried my best not to talk about my injury, and instead turned the conversation to their recent classes. Allison tried to interrupt me with questions and comments, but I tried not to pay attention to her and avoided eye contact. After about 15 minutes of lively conversation, I noticed Nancy say something to Allison. Shortly after, Allison announced that it was time for the children to leave, as I was still in pain and needed to recover. She said goodbye to the children and promised to visit me the next day. Saying goodbye, the children smeared my hands with saliva. Amber seemed to be in a better mood than when she arrived and Jerry seemed fine. But when Whitney looked at me from afar, sitting on a hospital bed, there were tears in her eyes. She hurriedly turned away, trying to hide her emotions. When the children left, Allison told them to wait in the elevator lobby while she stayed for a few minutes to talk to her father. Then, Allison came up to me. I didn't have the opportunity to fully think through my reaction, and I couldn't change the scenario I imagined. So I just closed my eyes and listened. Brian, I'm sorry you had to see me like this. I never wanted you to know I'm not the wife you deserve, she said, her voice full of remorse and sadness. I hope we can talk about it when you feel better. When she didn't get any reaction from me, she said, Maybe tomorrow you'll be in the mood for a conversation. If you want to, just call me. Her last words hinted that she had no intention of visiting me in the hospital. It became clear that I needed to contact her and talk to her. Otherwise, she wouldn't have come. Dr. Petra returned about 20 minutes after Allison left. After another inspection, she noticed, You don't look too upset after talking to your wife. I corrected her. I haven't talked to my wife. I replied flatly. Despite the deep sadness of my lost life, I was determined to channel these emotions into fruitful work. I assured Nancy that I wouldn't be sick anymore. She smiled at my words and asked the doctor how long I needed to stay. The doctor advised to spend another night in the hospital with the possibility of discharge the next day if the examination is successful. But I was instructed not to burden myself for at least a week and to refrain from returning to work for several days. The doctor's orders were not subject to discussion. She replied in as firm a voice as a woman with a small stature is capable of. I promise, I grinned, then reached out and took her hand. That is, I promise if you don't tell my wife that you will let me go on Friday morning. Of course I can't ask you to lie to her, but if she's even interested, could you give me a hint that I'll have to stay until Saturday? I think I can do it, Dr. Petra laughed. Unless I have to lie outright in response to a direct question, I'll tell Sister Nancy the same thing. After finishing a hearty dinner, I contacted my parents, with whom Allison did not communicate for reasons that seemed obvious. Then I called my assistant at work and asked him to bring a notebook and a pen. I was in no condition to start planning my tasks that evening, but I tried to be ready to complete them in the morning. As I predicted, Allison arrived with the children around 3.50 p.m. on Thursday. As expected, she hadn't bothered to visit me the day before, and I wasn't going to contact her either. Although Nancy claimed that she called the medical center only once to check on me. By the time the kids arrived on Thursday, I was already feeling much better. This was due not only to my physical recovery, but also to the fact that I had a very productive day. I was visited by several colleagues from my office, my lawyer Gail, who helped me draw up a prenuptial agreement, and my parents even stopped by for lunch. Although none of this had anything to do with my research on proximity sensors, it was all about planning my future outside of work. After spending half an hour with the children, Nancy came, 
as I had asked earlier, and insisted that I need to rest. Allison came up to me as she had the day before, but this time I didn't close my eyes while she was talking. Honey, you didn't get in touch today to discuss our situation, she said softly. It seems like I'm not worth checking out if I'm not trying to contact you. I replied with a note of sarcasm, trying to downplay it, but probably failing. My love, she whispered softly. I didn't want to bother you if you weren't in the mood to talk. I'll probably be busy this weekend. My love, I replied sarcastically. Brian, I am so sorry. I really hope that after that we can move on, she murmured. Then she took my hand and kissed it but I remained emotionless. As she left, she said goodbye quietly, waving her hand slightly at me. I was not left indifferent by the fact that she never once mentioned her love for me or the termination of her affair with Roger Mayberry. I could only catch a hint of sincere regret that she had been caught. The remaining 10% of my plan, which still needed to be completed, was now easy to solve. Shortly before visiting hours ended, Allison's parents came to see me. I was stunned until they delicately explained the reason for their visit. It seems that Allison didn't want to threaten me with losing custody of the children in the event of our divorce, so her parents did it instead. Allison has admitted her mistake, her mother said, taking my hand. Really? I asked sarcastically. After a long pause, her mother replied, You know that very well. That's what caused your accident. I just hope you find the strength to forgive her, Brian. You are such a good father and a loving person, and I know it will destroy you if you are not around your children every day. You're right about that, of course, Ruth, I said grimly. The gloominess was just a pretense. The most important thing in my plan was to get sole custody of the children. After a brief exchange of pleasantries, after Allison's parents gave me a message that I knew their daughter wanted to send, they left. Any uncertainty about my future actions disappeared. On Friday morning, Dr. Petra performed another checkup, after which she approved my release. Remember that you shouldn't strain yourself for at least a week, she advised. Scout honor, I replied, trying to say the Boy Scout greeting. Not being a Boy Scout, I wasn't sure how accurate my gesture was, but at least I made Dr. Petra laugh. After thanking Nancy, I tried to give her $500 in cash, but she had to refuse. Instead, I gently hugged her and left with my assistant Jack before 10 in the morning. Getting back at Roger Mayberry was a piece of cake. I could have just asked him to fire me. But that wasn't enough for me. My goal was to completely ruin his career. Simply finding him another job in a similar field with almost the same salary would be an unsatisfactory punishment. I wanted to ensure that he lost his security clearance and he would not be able to find a job with the same salary and status as he had now. On the advice of Gail and her proposed divorce expert, as well as having access to Roger's bank details and his direct deposits, I decided to meet with Jezebel. Why with her? Because she will help me get sole custody of the children. My assistant drove me to Jezebel's office but I asked him to wait in the car. Although Jack was aware of all my plans, I felt obligated to talk to Jezebel alone. Despite the fact that I called in advance, Jezebel seemed surprised and glad to see me. Hi, Jezebel. I smiled when she came up to me with her big and beautiful figure. I have a concussion so I can't hug you as tightly as I would like. Maybe we'll just kiss each other's hands. Oh, you scoundrel, she teased, giggling. You probably got a concussion just so I couldn't hug you. We exchanged hand kisses, a rather unsatisfactory greeting. Jezebel looked amazing, dressed fashionably and at the same time professionally, radiated an eternal sensuality that seemed untouched for years. Come into my office, she insisted, squeezing my hand tightly. After expressing my delight at being reunited with Jezebel, I quickly moved on to the reason for my visit. I need your help, Jezebel, I confessed, feeling sadness rise in me. Anything, Brian? She replied, gently taking my hand. I'm ready to help you in any way I can. You made my dream come true. I totally agree, as long as there is no harm. Her words, accompanied by a warm smile, 
brought me more joy than I could have imagined. You got it, I replied with a laugh. I told her all the details of the situation that made me turn to her for help, including my emotional reaction and why I needed her support. I emphasized the importance of my children by proudly showing her the photos. When I said that my second child was named Whitney, she suddenly paused. Did you name her Whitney? She sighed in disbelief. I understood her thoughts perfectly and, despite the current situation, I saw nothing wrong with embellishing the truth a little. Yes, she was named after my beloved before the wedding, I said with a grin. This caused a rush of emotions in her. Tears welled up in her eyes. You scoundrel, I've cried for you only twice in the last decade. I giggled, gently taking her hand. Tears of happiness are a wonderful thing. How can I help you shed them now? Wiping away her tears, she made a request that took me by surprise. I would like to ask you to use your website to post explicit materials involving my wife and send payment for them to her bank account. When the initial shock passed, we discussed the situation in detail. She had some great suggestions and one particularly brilliant idea. You have to make sure that this is never traced back to you and that no one finds out about our previous relationship, she advised. A relationship? Is that what you call it? I was joking. Oh, hush, she laughed. Now it's my turn to teach you a lesson. I know someone who can help with this on a paid site even more popular than mine. No question. Just transfer to him the funds that Hill and Turn transferred to your wife's bank account. I will contact them immediately. In a short four-minute phone conversation with Jezebel's friend, everything was organized. She informed me of the required format of the videos and assured me that all the money I would provide would be transferred to her friend and an equal amount to Allison's account. In addition, my friend will require your wife's signature on the contract, which has a release clause. Can you trick her or convincingly reproduce it? I confidently stated, I can. She replied, I'll send it to you today. I suggested, wait until tomorrow. I will create a new email account in the library specifically for this purpose and will contact you as soon as she signs. As I left Jezebel's office, I grinned, feeling inspired. Before leaving, I risked a gentle kiss on her lips. Fortunately, my wife insisted that the credit card be issued exclusively in her name shortly after our wedding. I hadn't paid much attention to them before, but now I was determined to check the bank accounts issued only in her name. I knew that I would easily find these numbers in the documents scattered around the house. Roger and Allison's bank account numbers, Allison's credit card number, my own funds for financing and Jezebel's help, I had everything I needed for revenge. In addition, my loyal assistant Jack was always there to support me, and I knew that I could count on him in any situation. It is impossible not to note Jack's unwavering loyalty and dedication to our cause, he is not just my secretary, but my reliable assistant. Among all my employees, he is the highest paid, second only to the CEO and CFO of my companies. Having an engineering degree, he is excellent at analyzing data and implementing technical improvements in my ambitious projects. Despite his impressive qualifications, he is always ready to do more to support me. It was noticeable when he picked me up from the hospital and waited for me at Jezebel's. In addition, he was an outstanding first division football player in college, and in his senior year he played as a middle linebacker. He's six feet two inches tall, and he's a real asset on my team. He weighs almost 245 pounds of muscle, so finding jackets that fit him and won't tear his arms is not an easy task. Despite the potential risk of revenge, I planned everything carefully and did not lose hope. After Jack dropped me off at the house, I didn't check to see if Allison was there, and instead had a bite to eat before calling her cell phone. After lunch, I called Allison on her cell phone. Hello, dear. I see you called me, she purred, noticing my number on the caller ID. No need, I replied coldly, depriving my tone of any warmth. I'm leaving early and I'll take the kids for milkshakes. We'll be home around 5.30 p.m. Oh, I have to cook a nice dinner for you when you get back. She purred, 
trying to sound cheerful. Don't spoil the kids' dinner. Thanks for the parenting tips, I added sarcastically. See you at 5.30 p.m. The children were glad to see me and eagerly asked about my well-being, excitedly talking about their recent activities. Their faces lit up even more when I mentioned that we would go to the nearest store for milkshakes, their favorite treat. While we were all enjoying cocktails, I decided to sit down with them and explain that there would be some changes in the future, assuring them that it wasn't their fault. Although I tried to keep my tone calm and direct, Amber saw through my facade. I understand what you're getting at, she hinted. If you and mom get divorced, I want to live next to you, she said. Whitney, shocked, asked, are you getting a divorce? I answered quickly, let's not think about the worst for now. I calmed them both down, especially Whitney, who had a worried expression on her face. My mom and I are going through some difficulties right now, and I do not know how everything will turn out. But I want you to always remember, mom and I love you more than anything in the world. You three beautiful creatures are not the cause of our problems. Amber surprised me once again. You love us with all your heart, don't you, dad? And mom loves us, Jerry chimed in. Amber answered quickly, don't be too sure, kid. Wanting to defuse the tense situation, I gently put my hand on Amber's arm. Dear, I believe that mom deeply loves all of you. It's just that sometimes it's hard for her to express it. Let's not judge her, okay? Let's hope for the best. Whitney snorted softly, but Jerry and Amber seemed to put aside their doubts. When Jerry, with all the sincerity of an eight-year-old child, asked if I would come to his little league game at noon the next day, I couldn't help but grin. I wouldn't miss this event for anything, son, I assured him. Turning to my daughters, I asked cheerfully, Girls, what do you have planned for Saturday? Unfortunately, I missed my usual Thursday newscast due to my hospital stay, but by the time we got home around 5.20 p.m., all three children were in a good mood. I made sure that at least one child stayed between me and Allison during her greeting, as I was still afraid of any physical contact with her. Later in the evening, when the children went to bed, I retired to the guest room. Don't you want to talk? Allison asked, worried. I have a splitting headache from the concussion, and I just need to take pain pills and get some sleep, I explained. I quickly drank two Tylenol tablets, passing them off as painkillers prescribed by a doctor, and closed the door to rest. I can talk at any time. Allison said, closing the guest room door behind her. Avoiding real conversations or intimacy with Allison over the weekend turned out to be surprisingly easy for me. I started implementing my plan without any problems. The first tasks were simple. I used Allison's credit card to order two small high-tech video cameras and motion detectors for quick delivery to the house on Monday. I printed out the contract that Jezebel sent me and then quickly deleted it. I also printed out new benefit and health insurance forms from my company's database, putting the contract penultimate in the stack and noting where Allison should put her signature. Knowing that Allison would be accommodating over the weekend, but not for long, I handed her the documents on Sunday, explaining that they were intended for medical insurance, disability registration, and other purposes. I have updated the life insurance forms for work, making my wife and children co-beneficiaries. I left the documents with her, knowing that she would not read them all, but only skim through the first few pages. When she saw her name on the list of beneficiaries, she smiled, reassured that I was not going to leave her. She brought me the signed documents, interrupting my card game with Whitney and Jerry. Darling, she purred, handing me the papers. I casually tossed them into my briefcase and continued playing cards. I also contacted the CEO of the company where Roger Mayberry worked and asked to check the safety of five people in his department due to the sensitive nature of our work. Just as some companies are required to conduct random testing for prohibited substances, employees may not realize that their employer, not the government, is the initiator of this process. On Monday morning, after their children left for school, 
Allison felt compelled to discuss the matter. We can't avoid discussing what happened, she said firmly, sitting down across from me at the kitchen table. I resisted the urge to question our relationship and instead confessed, Allison, I'm still trying to process everything. I still haven't fully realized what I saw. I need to clear my mind before we can have a meaningful conversation. I will not act rashly. All right, dear, she replied, sounding satisfied, though not entirely happy. I hope you feel better soon. I want to show you how much I care about you. My children and I miss you. I forced a smile and answered, I miss them too. I have a social committee meeting at the country club in half an hour, but I'll be back at two to pick up the kids. Can you handle it without me? She asked. I wanted to say, I'll find out soon, but I restrained myself. Have a good time. I'll be fine, I replied. She was doing it too easily. About 30 minutes after she left, a courier delivered the cameras. I called Jack, and together we quickly, in less than an hour, installed cameras, switches, and motion sensors in the master bedroom. In order not to leave fingerprints or DNA, we worked with all the equipment in latex gloves. The next task was to send a signal to Allison's computer. If I could use computers, then Jack was just a vis-a-vis. -vis. All we had to do was find out her password, and then, in just 10 minutes, connect the cameras to her computer. Having installed the most effective password cracking program on my laptop, I connected my device to it and got to work, and Jack, without taking off his latex gloves, announced the plan. Having started the program, Jack began to suggest what we could do while waiting, but he was interrupted by a beep. Curious, I asked if the program had gone wrong. Jack assured me that this was not the case, and grinning, informed me that the password had already been hacked. Surprised, I asked how this was possible. Jack explained that the program first goes through a thousand of the most common passwords and then moves on to more complex algorithms. Laughing, he said that Allison's password was Princess, the 28th most common password, according to the program. I couldn't help but laugh at such predictability. She always ignored my advice about technology, so why wouldn't she listen when I suggested using random characters for a password? But Jack kept his promise, and ten minutes later, the camera footage was being recorded into a file on Allison's computer. After another five minutes, I could access this file from my office and control the cameras and motion detectors remotely. On Tuesday, feeling good, I went to work. Before leaving, I activated the cameras and motion detectors, ensuring the safety of the house. I arranged for the transfer of $10,000 from a shell corporation in the Cayman Islands to Roger Mayberry's bank account. Feeling emotionally stable and physically recovered from the concussion, I was able to focus on work. In the evening, after putting the children to bed, Allison asked me to join her in our bed, noting my improved condition. I refused, feeling almost normal. For a week, I allowed myself to imagine a scenario in which Allison realized her mistake, fell in love with me and ended her life with Mayberry, but I did not lose my vigilance, realizing that these thoughts were just fantasies. This was confirmed when I watched the video taken on Thursday, and saw my wife in a state of bliss, making intimate contact with Mayberry. I could only stand it for a few minutes. Despite the satisfaction of knowing that this video could help me get sole custody of my children, I was overwhelmed by a wave of sadness. On Friday morning, I uploaded Allison's scandalous video to a paid website, offering Jezebel $5,000 to post it. By Friday evening, the money had been transferred to Allison's account, and the video became available for viewing to paying customers. Unfortunately, Mayberry's face had to be pixelated due to the lack of it in the release. But I found solace in the fact that the video was posted in a section of the site called Wives Cheat on Their Husbands in the Marital Bed. It seemed appropriate. Over the next two weeks, two more videos were uploaded, as a result of which two more amounts of $5,000 were transferred to Allison's account. Another $10,000 were transferred to Mayberry's account from the Cayman Islands company. 
I realized it was time to figure out the situation before Allison and Mayberry saw the bank statements at the end of the month and became confused. Convincingly pretending that I couldn't help but cry, Allison asked me to do something inappropriate, and I told her in a trembling voice that I wasn't ready for it yet. To my surprise, she was understanding, saying she would wait until I was ready. The next day, a security check was carried out in Mayberry after the third video reached paying customers. The details of how this happened have been clarified. I don't know exactly how, but the columnist somehow turned out to have an unedited version of the video in which Mayberry enters into an intimate relationship with Allison, as well as an extract from Mayberry's bank account. Mayberry was the third person to be questioned that day, and it was obvious that he did not realize the importance of his interview. Knowing that the CEO would receive a report on the results of the lie detector, I managed to get a transcript of Mayberry's interview by the end of the day. During the interview, Mayberry was asked if he had any activities outside of work that could be used for blackmail. At first he denied having any, but the lie detector showed the opposite. The expert then showed Mayberry the video and asked about his relationship with the woman two weeks before. Mayberry's face paled as he weighed the consequences of lying and telling the truth about his confession. In the end, he decided to be honest. Allison Banks, isn't she married to your colleague Brian Banks? The interrogator asked him. Mayberry stammered and explained that Brian Banks worked for a related company in the same building. It's a big building, he managed to say. Have you ever thought that an affair with a married colleague is fraught with blackmail? Mayberry was stunned. I never thought about it, he admitted. Roger was asked about payments from foreign organizations since his last confession. Absolutely none, he said. But when asked about contributions from corporations from the Cayman Islands, he was confused. I don't know. It's probably a mistake, he stammered nervously. The reviewer expressed concern about the mistake made by two companies from the Cayman Islands, whose affiliation remains unknown. Yes, someone is trying to set me up. Mayberry complained, clearly upset. The reviewer then sarcastically asked if the video featuring Mayberry and Mrs. Banks was also fabricated. Despite trying to remain impartial, the reviewer ended the interview after a few questions. Mayberry was silent while the expert removed the electrodes from the lie detector. The expert then strictly warned him not to make any contact with anyone related to confidential information, neither with Mr. and Mrs. Banks, nor with the two corporations that deposited money in his account. Mayberry was told that if he disobeyed, he would face prosecution. Despite the seriousness of the situation, after talking with Mayberry, I felt satisfied. After making sure that the children were asleep, we went to bed. As we lay side by side, I knew this would be our last intimate moment. I couldn't help but admire Allison's ability to play along with my teasers, Grinning, I told her that I would never sleep with her, given her possible affairs, including with Mayberry. The shock on her face was priceless. She stuttered and blushed, demanding to know what I meant. The next morning, I was helping the kids get ready for school under Allison's icy gaze. As soon as they left, I made a quick phone call, and a few minutes later, the doorbell rang. It's for you, a walking woman, I joked. Allison blushed with anger and rushed to the door. How dare you talk to me like that, you idiot! She grumbled. It won't be long walking, I replied with a laugh. When Allison opened the door, the bailiff handed her the divorce papers. Allison Banks, you have received a subpoena, he announced. Along with the divorce papers were incriminating photos of her relationship with Mayberry on a paid website, as well as a password for access. Did you think I wouldn't know your dirty secrets, you lying woman? I teased while Allison stood at the kitchen table in disbelief. Have you even seen what you look like on this site? Here's a reality check for you, I shouted, pointing to a piece of paper with the address and password. I was shocked when my assistant pointed this out to me. It's bad enough that you disrespected me by sleeping with that jerk in our bed, but then you had to go out in public and take advantage of it. I don't understand what's going on, she said, and tears welled up in her eyes. 
I'm taking the kids for the weekend, I announced, getting up. Don't forget to hire the best lawyer you can find. Your income from professional porn will surely come in handy because you will need it. On the same day, Mayberry was fired and escorted out of the building. His security clearance was revoked, and just before I was about to leave to pick up the kids for the weekend, my secretary called the intercom. Brian, it's been reported that Roger Mayberry is drunk and in the parking lot, shouting your name. Should I call the police? I couldn't help but laugh. No, Sherry. Call Jack to come here immediately. The situation seemed too good to be true. When Jack arrived, we went to the window in our building, from which we could clearly see where Mayberry was making a scene. It just so happened that this was one of the best places for surveillance cameras in the building. He was staggering back and forth, obviously drunk. Without wasting a second, Jack slipped out the side door and hid next to the building, out of sight. I confidently walked out the front door, attracting Mayberry's attention. He immediately started hurling insults, accusing me of firing him and ruining his security clearance. When he lunged at me, I quickly headed to where Jack was waiting. I let Mayberry get close enough to swing at me, knowing that our plan was about to come to fruition. Even though I received only a light blow on my shoulder, I collapsed to the ground as if the most crushing blow in history had fallen on me. As Mayberry loomed over me ready to strike again, Jack suddenly appeared in front of the camera, swiftly grabbed Mayberry and delivered a powerful forearm blow to his jaw, similar to grabbing a football field. Mayberry flew backwards and lost consciousness. Jack came to my rescue and helped me to my feet while I feigned dizziness by leaning against a nearby car. Without hesitation, Jack dialed the emergency number. All this happened under the watchful gaze of surveillance cameras. The police arrived three minutes later, quickly handcuffed Mayberry to a stretcher, and sent him by ambulance to the hospital. I filed documents for assault charges, after which I took the children and went to a picturesque mountain resort for the weekend. At the end of the trip, I broke the news to the children that Allison and I were getting divorced. If Amber looked pleased, the other two children were surprisingly calm, reassured by my promise to continue to love them as much as possible. When we returned on Sunday evening, Allison's reaction was not as negative as I expected. Anticipating a possible explosion, I took precautions. I transported valuables and most of my clothes to a secure temperature-controlled storage facility. Despite this, I did not plan to leave the house. After the kids told her about our pleasant weekend, Allison and I started talking. Her first words were addressed to me. She noted my participation in the organization of the video, although she did not understand how I managed to do it. Despite the fact that I was surprised by the conciliatory tone, I did not apologize or admit my guilt. Instead, I just asked her to stop accusing me of something I clearly didn't do. I replied with a touch of indignation, fearing that she might be recording our conversation. I've been busy this weekend, Brian. I hired a lawyer and a computer expert, she explained. I still can't figure out how you managed to cover your tracks so well. It's not going to be easy for me to handle this. I understand your concerns, Allison. I hope we can negotiate custody, I said. Allison, we can resolve this issue. I suggest that you give me sole custody of the children and the house so that they have stability. In return, I will grant you extensive visitation rights. I'll even buy you a new house so you and Mayberry can enjoy it. Did you hear that he lost not only his job, but his entire career? I don't want to live in the same house with Roger. It's not that. It's that, she began. I quickly interrupted her. I don't want to hear this, Allison. I pulled myself together and said, You're free to be with whoever you want. I don't care. I'm just offering an option. After a moment of silence and a few tears, she said, I understand that you may think I'm a bad mother, but I'm not. I love our children more than anything in the world, and I can't accept the thought that I won't be able to be with them. None of us benefits from fighting in court. I know that you will try to ruin my reputation, and I will not survive this. None of us want the kids to know all the details or see the video. I agree that it is better to keep the children in the dark, 
What do you think we should do? I asked, genuinely interested. My lawyer recommends that we both agree to the services of an intermediary, preferably a former family court judge. I'm willing to consider sole or joint custody, and you can do the same. We will allow the mediator to assess the situation, take into account the preferences of the children and obey his decision. If we keep the case confidential, we can come to a decision faster, she replied. I was pleasantly surprised by her discretion. She seems to have recognized my strong personality, perhaps through a conversation with Roger Mayberry. Let's set up a meeting with our lawyers next week to discuss and clarify the details, I suggested. I have one condition. I will not agree to joint custody. It's too difficult for children. I am asking for sole custody, but I will agree to it only if the mediator makes the appropriate decision. I let Allison occupy the master bedroom while I slept in the guest room, without revealing the reason, so as not to cause even more stress. But now that everything is open, I refuse to sleep in the same room where Mayberry dealt with her. During our joint meeting with the lawyers on Tuesday, we both instructed them to simply comply with our legal requirements without any negotiations. We agreed to divide the entire property of the spouses 50-50, with some exceptions based on the prenuptial agreement. This agreement excluded 90% of our fortune and also stipulated an intermediary, a former family court judge with a solid reputation. The contract also detailed the schedule of hearings with the mediator and the deadline for his decision. The amount of alimony that I would pay in case of sole or joint custody of Allison and the duration of alimony payments to Allison in case of divorce. She was offended by the restrictions on communicating with Mayberry in the presence of children, but since she said she no longer wanted to see him, she reluctantly agreed to comply with them. In addition, she agreed not to talk to the children, trying to influence their testimony to the mediator. The agreement also stipulated how much Allison could spend from my funds on new housing, whether it was a house, a condominium, or an apartment, in case I received sole custody and she had to leave our current home. We spent the whole day discussing the specific arrangements that would be required in the case of joint custody, or if one of us gets sole custody of the children. It was a long process, but we managed to come to an agreement. The potential mediator we contacted agreed to handle the case, and we discussed his remuneration, which would be equally divided from our joint property, not covered by the prenuptial agreement. We also set a briefing date in two weeks and a hearing date in four weeks. I didn't feel obligated for Allison to officially include these details in the contract. After discussing this issue face to face, we came to an agreement that outsiders would not be allowed into our common house and that the person who would have to leave would do so within two weeks after the custody agreement was finalized. In addition, I promised that my lawyer would contact the paid site to remove her video and refund them the money. Fortunately, one call from Jezebel was enough to resolve this issue. I've never tried to change the kids' minds and as far as I know she hasn't tried either. We never exchanged unkind or sarcastic remarks even in private. The only questionable behavior she demonstrated was walking around the house without outerwear when the children were asleep or they were not at home. I understood her motives, but out of frustration I once asked her about it. On the day of the hearing I was worried even though I was sure that I had an advantage. I was hoping for sole custody, so the possibility of joint custody was the worst outcome I could imagine. As the hearing approached, my anxiety grew. The process seemed to be going well until the judge made a few remarks that made me wary. It seems he was leaning towards joint custody. Shortly before the children were supposed to be interviewed, he surprised us by offering to watch the interview on closed-circuit television. The mediator's request took me by surprise, and I couldn't agree to it. I'm sorry that I didn't realize this just a few minutes ago, but it will destroy the necessary frankness and trust in children. If one of you cannot agree to me meeting with each child alone, I will have to refund your money and give you a recommendation from another intermediary. Since the interviews with the children were supposed to take place tomorrow anyway, on the day they don't go to school, let me know. 
I was almost inclined to say that I did not agree, and hoped that we could find another mediator less inclined to joint custody than this one. My lawyer urged me not to do this, citing Amber's hostility to Allison and the fact that the mediator listened to the children's preferences. Since Amber is approaching the age when she can make decisions on her own, the judge is likely to listen to her opinion more than to the opinion of any other mediator. Before leaving home, Allison and I met with our lawyers and agreed to the mediator's terms. We also agreed that we would not ask the children about what they said later. That evening at dinner, Allison made a few remarks that I thought the children took as an expression of her desire for joint custody. I just gave her a hard look and didn't say anything in response. Amber caught my eye and smiled slyly. The next day, the mediator met with each of the children separately. The conversation with Jerry took about 20 minutes. With Whitney, about half an hour. Amber has more than an hour. When Amber came out after making sure Allison and her lawyer weren't looking, she gave me a thumbs up. According to our agreement, Allison's parents took the children to eat after the interview, telling them to return to our house around 4 p.m. After we stopped for lunch, the mediator was ready to make a decision. We didn't expect this. According to the agreement, he had another week to resolve the issue, so there were no obligations. He didn't even want to listen to the half-hour closing arguments that the lawyers had prepared. After carefully reviewing all the evidence and prioritizing the welfare of the children, I have decided to grant sole custody of all three children to their father, Brian Banks. In addition, I believe that the existing agreement, agreed upon by both sides, is fair and in the best interests of children. Therefore, the case will be resolved on the terms set out in the contract. On Monday, you will receive a certified copy of this decision to submit it to the family court, along with the settlement agreement. Thank you for entrusting this case to me, and I wish you all the best in the future. Allison and I shed tears for different reasons. The atmosphere on the way home was heavy and sad. I didn't feel angry and she looked depressed. The familiar feeling of sadness came over me again when our family breakup became final, although it was necessary and ended peacefully for me. That evening when we broke the news to the children, Allison was distant, so I had to lead most of the conversation. I hugged Allison warmly and Amber hugged her. I spoke positively about Allison and explained the order of the visit. A week after the hearing, I bought a new house for Allison and she moved into it within the agreed two-week period. With the help of our children, her parents and her brother, we helped her with the move. We also hired a transportation company to move large items, such as a double bed from the master bedroom. A few months later, when the divorce was finalized, I threw a party at my house to express my gratitude to all the people who supported me, especially close friends and parents. I kept the purpose of the party a secret from the kids, just calling it a communal celebration. But my 13-year-old daughter Amber was able to figure it out for herself. Shortly before the guests arrived, Amber entered the room and closed the door. Then she made me sit down and sat on my lap, asking a difficult question. When I asked her why she was doing this, she smiled broadly and told me that she had talked to an intermediary. She told him that she saw my mom and another man making love in our house, and that it had a negative effect on her. I was amazed and asked if she had actually witnessed it. Amber replied that it didn't matter because her mom was cheating, and she wouldn't want to live with her if she was awarded custody. Realizing that it was in Jerry and Whitney's best interests to stay with us, she shared the news with a big smile, then kissed me on the cheek and quickly left. I decided not to bring up this issue, but focused on celebrating the victory and chasing Jezebel. Jezebel looked amazing at the party and quickly found common ground with Jerry and Whitney. She spent a lot of time playing baseball with Jerry and became close to both of them. She has succeeded in this field much more than I have. Jezebel was talking to Whitney alone. I do not know what they were talking about but it seems that they enjoyed each other's company laughed and chatted for quite a long time. Amber was a little shyer around Jezebel than the other kids, 
but she seemed to make a good impression on her while they were discussing fashion. Jezebel tried to introduce me to our family. In the middle of the party, she pulled me aside into a booth, hugged me and whispered, Let your parents look after the children today, and you will come home with me. I promise you'll be safe when I bring you back tomorrow at 10 in the morning, but I can't guarantee that you'll be fully conscious. Without waiting for an answer, she gave me a seductive kiss and stormed out of the room. That night, Jezebel nearly drove me crazy with desire. When I left, I confessed, Jezebel, I do not know what you see in me, but I like being with you. Can there be a real connection between us? I see you as a kind, generous, and intelligent person. How about taking me to the resort with you for three days starting on the 14th, so that we can determine if we both want a serious relationship? To be honest, I'm tired of casual relationships. I need a man who belongs only to me. After kissing me, she closed the door behind me, urging me to return to my beautiful children. Two years after this momentous event, my life has undergone many changes. All three children do well at school, live in society and play sports. They are well adapted and happy. Allison is responsible for her visitation rights and maintains a positive relationship with her children. Amber has also improved her relationship with Allison and even spent last summer at her parents' lake house with the kids without any problems. Besides, my business is booming and I am experiencing financial success like never before. Information about my involvement in transactions with companies surfaced by accident, as the report that we provided to the government was mistakenly sent to employees who should not have seen it. Despite this, the attitude of others towards me has not changed. Roger Mayberry left town shortly after the victory celebration, and according to the only employee who still keeps in touch with him, he got a job as a simple salesman for an electronics company on the West Coast that does not work with secret technologies. The children fully accepted Jezebel as a friend, not as a mother and enjoyed her company immensely. Two years later, Jezebel decided that we should be exclusive. She recently sold her adult website and moved in with me and the kids. Although marriage is out of the question, she devotes herself only to me and takes on maternal responsibilities towards children, while simultaneously running a small business selling specialized clothing over the internet. I've driven along Hooch Road many times before, but I've never noticed a small white farmhouse to my right. He was standing on the side of an old highway that runs through the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee. This road, with its various sections such as the Chickasaw Turnpike, has had a rich history. During my grandfather's youth, it was known simply as Hooch Road, a winding dirt road through the Carolina Mountains that played an important role in the birth of NASCAR, thanks to the moonshine racing enthusiasts who settled on its turns. The house was neat, newly painted white, and surrounded by a sturdy fence of planks and timber that enclosed a pasture on one side. When steam came out from under the hood of my truck due to a punctured radiator hose, I realized that my time on this road was limited. I quickly pulled into a gravel parking lot and parked halfway to the house. Hello, is anyone at home? I called out, knocking on the wooden door. Mountain dwellers might be wary of strangers, but once you earned their trust, they became one of the most hospitable people you could meet. Despite this, I decided to stay on the porch, keeping my distance just in case. After a while, a face appeared in the window above his head, the features of which were unclear. A female voice asked, who are you and what do you need? I replied, My name is Joshua Sutton from Waynesville. I was hoping I could fix my truck and get some water from you. I have a burst radiator hose which I quickly repaired a few miles ago, but it doesn't hold up. The woman told me to wait and then disappeared from sight. Looking around the neighborhood, I couldn't help but admire how neat and well-groomed everything looks. The nets were intact. The porch was painted with fresh paint, and there was a wonderful garden on the side of the house. As I headed for the door, I was greeted by two imposing German shepherds who stood silently and obediently next to their owner. Behave yourself, and the dogs won't bother you, 
the woman assured me, opening the door and gesturing for me to enter. Come on in. Can I get you something to drink? Can I have a glass of water, please? I asked. Are you from the Sutton family of Sandy Hollow? There are quite a few of them in Zaki Hollow, she asked. I shook my head. No, ma'am, as far as I know, no. My ancestors are from Waynesville, and as far as I know, we are not related to Sandy Hollow. But I suppose anything is possible. The woman brought me water and offered me to sit down, and her dog was watching me closely. The refreshing cold water satisfied my parched throat, and a light breeze from the fan dried the sweat on my shirt. My name is Sandra Dresser, and theirs, she pointed to a pair of dogs sitting next to her, is Samson and Delilah, their tongues lolling lazily. Miss Sandra, nice to meet you. I was wondering if you have any materials that I could use to create a pliable tube that looks like rubber. I saw a group of vintage cars in the field over there. Oh, don't be shy. Take whatever you need if it helps you, Sandra said. I thanked her and carefully got up from the table, trying not to scare the dogs. Despite my efforts, they stayed on all fours until Sandra ordered them to sit down, and they obediently obeyed. As we walked out the door with the two dogs, I couldn't help but admire Sandra's figure coming down from the porch. She looked to be about 30 years old, with long dark hair pulled back in a ponytail and tucked under a cap. She was wearing work boots, skinny jeans and an old t-shirt, and her eyes were bright blue. Grabbing tools from my truck, we headed across the pasture to a group of old cars parked behind a dilapidated barn. I rummaged through the collection and found some flexible steel and rubber hoses, as well as clamps to temporarily fix the car. An hour later, my truck was ready to go. Evening was approaching and she suggested, It's time for dinner. Why don't you go inside, clean yourself up, and eat before you continue your journey? Her invitation was filled with genuine warmth. I hesitated at first, but eventually my rumbling stomach convinced me to agree. The alluring aromas wafting from the kitchen were irresistible, and I couldn't resist. Sandra did not disappoint, serving an appetizing dish of smoked pork chops, creamy mashed potatoes, fragrant collard greens and spicy black-eyed peas, accompanied by warm, moist cornbread. To top it all off, she treated me to a delicious bread pudding and steaming hot coffee. Sandra, that was the most delicious meal I've eaten in years, no kidding. Nothing unusual, she tried to downplay it. I don't have many guests, and I like to cook, so I think you came just in time. She fed a few pieces to two dogs who were looking at me the whole time I was there. They quickly devoured the food and continued to sit with their tongues hanging out. By the way, what are those old cars near your barn? If you want to sell a few of them, I know a couple of people who might be interested. After a brief glance at me, she said, They actually belong to my ex-husband. They've just been standing here since he left. A Fairlane and a Ford pickup truck can make good money if you decide to sell them. He hasn't been here for two years, and I think we need to do something about it, she admitted. A year ago, a man from Knoxville came to us and tried to buy it at a very low price. He thought I was gullible, but I didn't fall for it and sent him away. At the memory of that moment, a smile spread across her face, lighting up the whole room. I helped her clean up after dinner, and when I was done, I realized that it was time for me to hit the road before it got dark. Although I had only met this woman a few hours ago, there was a charming politeness about her. As I was preparing to leave, I felt a little disappointed. Miss Sandra, I have a friend who would be very interested in buying your 57 Ford. If you're going to sell it, I'll be happy to let him know. Here is my business card. Feel free to call me. I will be happy to come here again in the future. I think she understood that I was hinting at a return visit, but for now, she left the decision to her. After shaking hands kindly, I started the car and drove back to Hooch Road. As I drove along Highway 325 toward Pittman Center, I couldn't stop thinking about the beautiful woman in the white farmhouse. She informed me that her ex-husband had left two years ago, just at the time when I became an ex myself. Every day I think about the past, about how bad it was, and how damn good I felt back then.
Unfortunately, the wrong people keep reminding me of this. My marriage to my ex-wife lasted five years before she left. I always thought it was a good five years, and June still holds that opinion. But, it's been a long time since we first met. Back then she was just a 19-year-old waitress at a diner, and I was a 23-year-old handyman who was trying to make ends meet by transporting truck parts across several counties. Despite financial difficulties I managed to cover all my expenses. On the other hand, June could afford to pay for the car while she lived with her parents. It was at this time that I plucked up the courage and asked her out on a date. But she rejected me, saying she was already dating someone from Asheville. She didn't realize that she was just a casual fling for the drum circle statue and nothing more. When I stopped by the barbecue bar later, there was a break in their relationship. I took a chance and asked her out again and this time she agreed. We had dinner together, had a beer, and went to the violinist show in Maggie Valley, where we had an amazing time. It was so pleasant that we repeated it several more times. All in all, it was an unforgettable time. A few months after I proposed, we tied the knot in a beautiful outdoor ceremony next to a charming old country church in Sunburst, North Carolina. A year after that, we managed to save up money and buy a gorgeous white frame house on a few acres south of town. There was nothing extravagant about it, but there was a place for a garden and a barn where I could work on my projects. At that time we didn't have children yet, and June combined working at a barbecue cafe with classes at the local community college. For several years I was constantly on the move, delivering and taking orders, sometimes staying overnight in Tennessee. This continued until June graduated from high school and got a job as a shift nurse at the local county hospital. I continued to make daily trips and eventually got promoted to regional manager, which did not greatly affect the time spent on the road, but increased my salary thanks to commissions from all sales. Since we both worked full time and June worked shifts, we had to cherish the time we could spend together during the week. She usually had to take turns every weekend, and every 12 weeks she switched to night shifts with a 12-hour shift. The only positive thing was the salary increase. Over time she began to earn almost as much as I did, which allowed us to double the payments for the house. On weekends when her schedule allowed, we visited several nightclubs in Asheville along with several other couples we knew. Gradually some of her colleagues began to join us, resulting in a weekend party consisting of about 12 people who got together quite regularly. We often visited the dance hall on Patton Road in Asheville. It was a cramped and narrow room that comfortably accommodated many people. As a rule, we came in pairs. Most of us were married. Throughout the evening, like June, I danced with different people. I didn't see anything wrong with that, because usually people dance with friends or acquaintances from school. I did the same thing as June. As I said, everything was fine. We left with the same people we came with. But, as it often happens, there will always be someone or something that will ruin everything. A few months after we started going to this place, I always danced with a girl from our band named Terry, who was June's colleague. She kept taking us to the other side of the dance floor, but I didn't think much of it at the time because I was generally naive. When the next music track started playing, she snuggled up to me in a slow dance. We were far away from our table in the corner of the room. Jesus, Terry, what are you thinking about? I asked. Nothing you don't already want, she replied with a seductive smile. As a young man dancing with a beautiful woman who smelled amazing, my blood boiled. But despite the temptation, I was happily married and promised to be faithful. Terry, I'm devoted to one woman, I insisted. If June hadn't been there, we probably would have been at my house next week. But June will do it tonight, I said with a smile trying not to brush her off. She just smiled back and replied, Oh, someday I'll have the opportunity. We moved on to another topic and finished the dance, after which I returned her to the escort, a man named Tom. June and a few other people were still dancing, and looking around the dance floor, I noticed that she was dancing very close to a man I didn't recognize. He whispered in her ear, making her smile and laugh. Suddenly he grabbed her, and she seemed to like it. 
I briefly thought about joining the dance, but then I remembered Terry. Looking back I realized that I should have intervened, but that moment has already passed. Another round of drinks was ordered, and June returned to the table with her new dance partner. I pretended I didn't know when she introduced him as Charlie, a school friend before his family moved to Asheville. I immediately disliked him, most likely because of where he put his hand. His smug expression and the way he looked at me with his hand on my wife's shoulder also contributed to this. But when June noticed my reaction, she took his hand away and eventually he left after a short exchange of opinions. I wanted to contradict him but I kept my composure. The conversation on the way home was predictable. Do you let every man touch your buttocks when you dance with him, June? I asked. No more than if you were touched by a girl, she replied, surprising me. She quickly took me to the other side of the room. I'm not going to let this happen, and I'm going to stop it like this, I replied. Well, you too, big boy. Are you jealous every time a man thinks he has a chance at the impossible? June replied. She chuckled, easing the tension in the room. Charlie has about the same chance of getting me into bed as Terry Nunn, she said confidently, and she was right. After it was getting close to midnight, we decided to leave for the night. When we got home, I managed to have a good time with her. Everything went well for the next few months. We met regularly, distributing the duties of drivers among ourselves. One Saturday night, I found myself one of the few men in a group dominated by women, and there were more of them. Four men from our company were unable to attend the weekend meeting. June and several of her friends were enthusiastically drinking tequila and thirsty to get drunk. June's tendency to lose all her inhibitions when drinking tequila was well known. This meant that she would have to be tinkered with. I tried my best to keep up with her and dance as much as possible. The dance floor quickly filled with other girls, including June's friend, who was supposed to keep an eye on June and the rest of the group while I fended off Terry's audacious advances. She joined the other girls outside to get some fresh air. Josh, she's safe, Terry said. When the dancing ended, I found myself back on the patio, where the smokers indulged in their habit. June and her friends were still laughing, so I decided to leave them alone and return to the table. Most of the party participants were on the dance floor, and I joined Terry and another girl they were talking to. They were both very drunk, and the other girl was completely drunk. Josh, June says you have a giant in your pants, the drunk girl muttered. I burst into loud laughter when she was having trouble pronouncing the words, and Terry was just grinning stupidly. But then she accidentally said something that sobered us all up. I was the only one at the table who didn't drink too much. Drunk people find everything funny and don't have a filter. It's not fair that she has two and we don't have one, she complained. They thought it was funny, and they started giggling. But soon Terry realized the gravity of the situation. The meaning of these words became obvious to me when they burst out of the mouth of this drunk girl. Ignoring Terry's reaction, I casually asked, Who else has such a big one? Charlie's name slipped by before she could stop, earning a disapproving look from Terry. Oops, probably shouldn't have said that, right? She hissed, trying to back away after Terry's reaction. Even under the influence of alcohol, Terry seemed to understand the significance of the conversation at the table. I went to the bathroom when Terry tried to intervene. Not now, Terry, I said firmly. The comments made may have had a different meaning than it seemed to me at first glance, and this left me in the dark. Two tipsy women were laughing at the fact that there were two men in my wife's life, me and a man named Charlie. It was unclear if they were hinting that she had a history with him before me during our relationship or now. Perhaps it was just the ravings of a man who had drunk too much. When closing time came, I gathered an intoxicated group of friends in the courtyard. The two of us, appointed drivers, loaded everyone into two cars and set off. When June and I arrived home at two in the morning, I had to drag her to bed like a sack. Sitting outside and sipping a beer, I thought about the situation. If this behavior was a one-time thing, I could put up with it but it seems to be becoming a pattern. This is not just a one-time occurrence. The irony is that I know how she feels about me. If she had a slip-up due to excessive drinking or something like that, 
I would forgive it as a one-time mistake. But if it was the same Charlie as a few months ago, it would be unforgivable. Sometimes I stayed over at her place on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. June had a day off on Tuesdays which gave her a great opportunity to do what she loved without the risk of being caught. It seems fate played a role in my marriage. On Tuesday evening, instead of staying in Sevierville, Tennessee, I drove back to Waynesville. Armed with a bag of barbecue and a few drinks, I settled down to watch the game from the upper field next to our house. When I arrived at 11 o'clock in the evening, I noticed that June's car was gone. I called her and told her I'd be home late. She replied that she planned to stay at home, watch TV and maybe call her sister or someone else before going to bed. I was sitting in the car, leaning back with the window down, the radio was playing, the lights in the cabin were turned off. Around midnight, two pairs of headlights drove out of Waynesville and slowed down before turning into the yard. June's car stayed in its usual place, and another car parked right behind her. Unsurprisingly, it was he who drove up. Charlie's rival on the dance floor, a cheeky shoe cleaner in a cowboy hat. Everything was going on as usual. The lights came on in the bedroom, then the night lights which we strategically placed by the bed, softly lit up. Despite the temptation to go inside, I stayed where I was, consumed with anger at her and at the whole world. If I had evil intentions, I could have resorted to drastic measures. But the thought of prison, even the local county detention center scared me off. I stayed where I was until the lights came on at two in the morning. Soon her lover appeared from the front door. He kissed her, exchanged words, and walked silently to his car while June scolded him for being silent. As I said before, if I were some kind of terrible person, Charlie would be decomposing in the ground at the moment. But I decided to start the car, turn off the headlights, and drive back to Waynesville. Over the next two weeks, I made several more unsuccessful attempts, as a result of which I finally decided to give up. When they returned home earlier than usual the following week, I took action. I crossed the street, walked up to his car and flattened all four of his tires, as well as one of June's tires. When I got to the back of the house, I noticed that the night lights were already on and the bedroom window was open to let in cool air. Quietly entering through the back door, I turned on the video recording function on my phone and headed to the bedroom. Turning on the light, I met their surprised looks, which were truly priceless. It seems like a pretty brave thing to do, I told them both. He staggered aimlessly not understanding what was going on around him. June was clearly shocked to be caught and sobbed uncontrollably. I gestured at the gun on my belt and ordered him to leave immediately. Hastily grabbing his clothes, he rushed past me, desperately trying to escape. When the door slammed behind him, he let out a scream. Oh my God, my car! He shouted, realizing that his tires were cut. Without looking back, he disappeared never returning to the house. Josh, let me be clear. I understand that there are many excuses for the behavior of all participants, but in the end, when all is said and done, there comes a moment of realization that is shocking. June, please be quiet and listen to everything I have to tell you. Just tell me one number. Tell me how many times it has been pleasant for you to communicate with this person. Josh, I'm begging you to listen to me she begged. Just one number. How many times? I will ask you over and over again until you answer. Just once, I swear, she exclaimed. Thank God, I muttered, leaving the bedroom and heading to the kitchen for a cold beer. The floor creaked softly as I looked at her in a worn pink robe. After finishing my drink, I opened another one and went outside. The jerk was gone his car with four flat tires glistening in the moonlight. I chuckled to myself, feeling satisfied with my manhood. A few weeks ago, I had already let out all my tears. Now it was necessary to focus on the task at hand. I took my truck out of the field and parked it behind the house, considering my next steps. I remembered the hitch in the barn, which was ideal for transporting goods. I hitched the bastard's car to the hitch and started the five-mile drive to Waynesville. 
As I was driving about a mile and a half down the road I passed him. His car flattened off the wheels, following me on all four wheels. I left his car in the parking lot and drove home. When I entered the house, June was sitting at the kitchen table. Josh, can we talk about this please? What is it? She asked. I looked at her and just answered. Not today. After which he took the remaining six bottles and went to his office. This is a men's cave for mechanics. And I've set up a pretty decent place for myself to rest in the attic. To the soundtrack from the Mars Hotel, I finished the rest of my beer and fell asleep. The next day, I called my boss and said that I had personal problems that needed to be solved at home. I went back to the house to deal with this slutty woman. June, it's time for you to move in and live with your sister. It's your own fault for this situation. To my surprise, she didn't protest. Perhaps she thought that if she called it a one-time mistake, then everything would be fine. After the two of them fixed the flat tire, the sister helped load the things into both cars. Before leaving, Anne, June's sister, came over to talk to me. I have always treated her with sympathy and have not harbored any ill feelings towards her because of our family connection. Josh, are you going to make up with her? Do you know that she's not just having fun with me? Anne shook her head, wiping away a tear. You've always had such a good time together. It breaks my heart that this has happened. I feel the same way, dear sister, I replied, hugging her before they left. The next day I filed for divorce, and chaos ensued. It all started with June, then with her parents, then with my parents, siblings, and finally with friends. Each of them believed that we could solve our problems and step over a one-time mistake. June, it's time to confess. Otherwise I'll share videos and photos of you cheating on me with everyone you know. Shock showed on her face when she realized that I knew about her past meetings. She eventually told them something that led to a change in her excuses. The constant excuse was that we were young and constantly making mistakes, that we could fix everything and maybe even start a family. It became inexorable. I got to the point where I only answered work-related calls. I told June to get everything she needed from home while I was at work. I decided to keep the house for myself and buy out her share without offering alimony. We invested everything we had in the house, apart from a small pension from work. It was a simple decision. The divorce was finalized six months later, but attempts to reconcile did not stop. June often bothered me at the restaurant, joining me at the counter or bar. Her sister Anne visited me regularly to chat and bring me food. At some point, I suspected that Anne might be interested in me, but it turned out not to be so. In the end, I came up with a new plan to put an end to all this. I contacted Terry and invited her to go to the club on Patton on Friday night. I was surprised when she agreed to spend the whole weekend at my house and ended up in my bed. This woman turned out to be bigger than I expected. She completely exhausted me, but I couldn't wipe the smile off my face all week. I chose Terry not only because of her qualities, but also because I knew she couldn't keep secrets. I was sure she would share all the details with her work friends, including June. Surprisingly, everything turned out even better than I imagined. The next weekend came, and on Friday evening I decided to go to the dance hall alone. It looks like June switched to the day shift, as she was there with some members of our old band and, to my surprise, with Charlie. The thought processes of women have always been a mystery to me, but I suppose this is a typical male point of view. June, her sister, her parents, and other people from the past, not counting a few women with other intentions, were making plans for our reunion. And yet she was with Charlie. Sitting at the bar, I leisurely enjoyed a cold beer, watching couples dancing on the dance floor. Suddenly, June and Charlie came out on the dance floor and put on a rousing performance, it seems, for my entertainment. After they finished, the Cretan returned to his table, and June came up to me at the bar. It doesn't have to be like this, Josh, she said. Confused, I replied, what do you mean? We're not together, and I'm not with anyone else. I'm the only one here, I said, looking around the room defiantly. June's face began to turn red. 
a familiar sign that she was about to lose her temper. I quickly intervened, leaned over to her and said softly, Listen carefully, June. I don't care that this monkey lives in your house. You have been with him for a long time, so you can continue to communicate with him. I'm sure you know that I had a great time with your friend Terry last weekend. Her reaction was instantaneous. She jumped back and slapped me hard in the face, after which she burst into tears. Her lover, who was sitting at the table, got up and started moving towards the bar, but hesitated when I raised my hand in his direction. Do you see that jerk you're with now? He froze when I raised my hand. All he cares about is having a good time and nothing more. This has always been his priority, and you've given him what should have been mine over and over again. You took away what was sacred between us and let this disgusting man get into our bed, into our lives. And now you have to put up with it. I've had enough. With these last words, I finished the rest of the beer and left. She ran after me with tears in her eyes when I left. I ended up at Jack of the Wood, enjoying Green Man Ale and watching the dancing girls. I later found out that June left with a friend shortly after me, and it was said that she did not go out as often as before. Even though June claimed that I was dating Terry again, I resisted the temptation because I was focused on my work. June and Anne kept coming up to me at every opportunity. Anne seems to have realized that this is a futile effort. Another problem that has arisen is the relationship between her parents and mine. Despite my absence, my parents continued to invite June to the barbecue. She became to them like the daughter they never had, and they didn't want to part with her. Divorce and its consequences have motivated all of us to make changes in our lives. Personally, I found solace in returning to the forest. Growing up in the Smokies and the National Forests gave me a sense of belonging and identity. I didn't know what it meant to be a hillbilly, but I knew I wasn't. I discovered that deep down, I have a passion for forestry. As a result, I decided to change my usual lifestyle. Instead of sticking to my usual route through Murphy or crossing I-40 at the entrance to Tennessee, I chose the scenic Hooch Road through the mountains. It may have been a little longer, but the scenic ride in good weather was worth it. I even had the opportunity to stop and enjoy fishing by the stream. It's a mystery to me how in all these trips, I never noticed a charming white house on the Tennessee side, but one day it still caught my attention. When I finished mowing the lawn and decided to take a break with a cold beer, the phone suddenly rang in my pocket. It was Sandra Dresser from Cosby, the woman I visited last week to fix my truck. For several days I couldn't get her out of my head. Something about her bothered me, despite our brief meeting. I was going to contact her about the 57th Ford to get some new information. Hello Miss Sandra, your hospitality always makes a lasting impression on me. I was planning to contact you soon about your old Ford, as well as some other cars. Your mention of them aroused my interest, and I decided to act. I thought it would be helpful if you would come and help me decide on my next steps. You have 11 old cars, and all of them, as far as I remember, were in excellent condition both in body and frame. The next steps are clear and understandable. Evaluate and sell them. She already knew about it, which made the invitation intimate. I'm going to go there next Thursday, but to be honest, I don't mind going for a ride in the mountains tomorrow because Sunday promises to be wonderful. I made this offer with optimism and faith. Half an hour later, I was sitting at a barber shop in Waynesville, enjoying a haircut and choosing a great Cabernet for the trip. Although I usually prefer beer, I can still tell a good red wine from a bad one. The next morning at 9 o'clock, I set off on a familiar route under a clear blue sky. Driving through a large stream, I noticed fishermen casting fishing rods on both sides of the bridge. I was tempted to stop and look at them, but I had obligations. As I was approaching my destination, I saw a young guy fishing for a large trout weighing one pound, caught, apparently, with fly fishing bait. I continued on my way, passing by Miss Sandra's house. On the threshold, she was chatting animatedly with a man, and her two dogs were closely watching her every move. After parking the car and walking down the driveway, I noticed that another man was sitting in another car and watching the conversation. 
The conversation grew louder as I approached. Bill mentioned that I could get a 65th share in exchange for the work I did for him a few months ago. Sandra stated, I don't know anything about any arrangements. Bill left here two years ago. So if he promised you something, resolve all remaining issues directly with Bill. Before he could speak, I said, Good morning, Miss Sandra. Is everything okay here? She looked at me with slight concern before answering, It's okay, Josh. This gentleman was just about to leave. The man's gaze met mine. His gaze was full of rage, but I just smiled and wished him a good day. We watched as he got back into his truck and drove off down the road towards Cosby. What was that? I asked. I think my ex-husband is giving me trouble. He is forbidden to enter the territory and even drive on the road in front of the house because of a court injunction, she explained. I couldn't help but smile and replied. How convenient. Before I forget, I brought a bottle of wine, St. Francis Cabernet, if you want. Put it in the refrigerator for a while. A benevolent smile did not leave her face as we returned to the porch, accompanied by the dogs. When the wine was safely stowed away, we sat down in an armchair and discussed the collection of old cars near the barn. Among them were the 57th Ford, the 65th Fairlane, the 67th Barracuda, the 69th Olds 442nd and the 48th Caddy, as well as several other inconspicuous sedans. It was a pretty valuable hiding place, especially if she could get a fair price for them. I mentioned that I know someone who would be interested in paying a good sum for the 57th Ford. I think, in the current state, you could get from eight to $10,000 for it, I informed her. Let them know that I'm interested, she replied. We continued to discuss the details, and I decided to contact a person in Sevierville who specialized in selling such things. I was hoping he would help sell it on commission to ensure a good price. When everything was settled, I was treated to a delicious fried chicken dish with all the necessary seasonings. After tidying up and clearing the table, we walked through the pasture and entered the mountain forest behind her house. The terrain was just amazing. A combination of farmland and mountains with lush greenery. We stopped next to a bubbling stream, admiring the peaceful landscape. So, Josh, tell me about yourself. Are you married, single, in a relationship, divorced? Where have you been and where are you going? I was caught off guard, not knowing how to respond, and decided to be honest by telling her a simplified version of my story. I shared with her the story of how I caught June with her lover which eventually led to the collapse of our marriage. I also told her how she, her sister, her parents, my parents, and all our friends tried to reconcile us. In an attempt to show June that I was moving on, I even mentioned dating Terry to get a reaction. I admitted that I had dated others, but nothing serious. Sandra listened with a knowing smile, showing that she too was experiencing a similar situation to one degree or another. Josh, let me share my story with you. I made the mistake of getting married right after graduating from high school. It turned out to be the biggest regret of my life. If I had known that after a few good years everything would turn upside down so quickly, I would have gotten out of this situation sooner. My ex-husband had delusional ideas, as did your wife. He was amused when I called her Pinocchio. That's probably the funniest name I could think of for him. I don't know if you knew Bill Dresser. It's on the south side of Hazelwood, in Balsam, not too far from where you are right now. It turns out, according to my father, Bill was in love with Cosby's girlfriend, who turned out to be not as interesting as he thought. They had something going on a few times, but he didn't mention that he was married. When she found out that I was his wife, she quickly ended the relationship. It's pretty funny, really. One day she came to our house while Bill was at work, apologized and confessed everything to me although we've known each other since high school we've never moved in the same social circles apparently bill was persistent and did not accept refusals as a result the girl went to texas to live with her father including because of bill's constant harassment what a jerk i thought the expression jerk was appropriate he chased her all the way to texas she called me to tell me about it and then I decided to pack all his things and leave them on the porch, telling him to come and get them before they deteriorated in the rain. 
Two days later, he returned, broke into the house in my absence, made a mess, and brought his things back into the house. When I returned home with Samson and Delilah in the evening, I put him in a corner with both dogs, cleaning up after him from the lawn. Do my dogs really know who their owner is? She gently stroked both dogs and they sat at my feet, happily wagging their tails and watching me. The next day, Dad and I visited the law office to get a restraining order against him. A few days later, he was taken to work. The following week, he returned to Texas and resumed his pursuit of the girl. I still talk to her sometimes. He may be a good guy, but she's wise enough to keep him at a distance. As far as I know, he lives in some woman's trailer in Silva. Sandra didn't seem bothered by this situation. She continued to smile brightly. Getting rid of this jerk was the best decision of my life, she said, after thinking about it. Our conversation continued, and I found out that Sandra had adjusted well to life after the divorce. She worked as a midwife in East Tennessee, mostly in the foothills. The farm she lived on was inherited from her grandmother, and before the divorce she grew tobacco on a three-acre plot. After she took care of the farm, there was no one to take care of it, and it fell into disrepair. While preparing to leave, I inspected the old cars near the barn and took some pictures to share with a friend. Despite the late hour and early work schedule the next day, we said goodbye warmly, hugged, and she kissed me on the cheek. I'll come by this week, maybe Thursday, if I get a response from my friend from Sevierville. If I can't come, I'll definitely call you. I will be very glad, Mr. Josh Sutton, she replied with a smile. That Sunday afternoon, I went excitedly to Hooch Road, feeling like a boy in love. It wasn't really a date, but it was more than just a pastime. I couldn't wait for Thursday. Every Tuesday at the barbecue restaurant, there was a special promotion. Fried catfish with all seasonings for nine and a half dollars, including drinks. The dish included thin strips of fish, coleslaw, beans, potato salad, and the famous Carolina buns. June and I often visited this place. But this evening I decided to go alone and took a booth to enjoy a meal while reading the newspaper. I barely had time to take a bite when they entered the restaurant and, noticing me, quickly and without hesitation joined me in the booth. Mom and June took the seats across from me. I couldn't deny that June looked amazing. She looked more than fine, and she was well aware that I had noticed it. Do you two always randomly show up when I'm sitting like this? I asked casually. We come here every Tuesday, Josh, you know that, her mom replied. June just smiled and turned on the charm with a twinkle in her eyes. She looked even more attractive. Feeling trapped, I reluctantly joined them. When we all loaded our plates into the buffet and sat down to eat, it seemed like there was a competition going on to see who would eat the most, and I was a participant in it. It was one of the strangest meals in recent times. It was like old times for the three of them. Isn't that great? Mom exclaimed with a big smile on her face, remembering how the four of us used to gather here every week. June's face lit up with memories. I just need to go to the bathroom. When I returned, Mom started to get up to let me back in, but I stopped her by gently touching his shoulder. No need. I have an early trip and I need to go to bed. I put a $20 bill on the table, smiled, and wished everyone a good night including June. With a satisfied grin, I walked out the door. It was only 6.30 p.m., and I was already sitting in the Bujum Tarum with a cold pint of beer in my hand. The pub has always been a favorite place, but recently it has become even better, as the owners Ben and Kelsey have started hosting concerts there on Saturdays. Now there was enough space to dance and enjoy the music. June and her colleagues didn't particularly like this place so I made it a rule to come here often. Besides, it was a good place to meet a like-minded woman. That evening, Ben was serving the bar and serving me my favorite double IPA, and I was looking around the neighborhood. A few girls were playing billiards, and some were sipping their drinks and watching the game on TV. It's been a while, stranger. How are you? What is it? She asked, sitting down next to me. As always, Terry looked incredibly attractive, perfect for such a relaxed evening. 
It's been a long time since we last met together. Well, Terry, you look amazing, and life seems to be kind to you. I sincerely praised her. I'm holding on, she replied. Things have been a bit hectic lately, but having you here gives me hope. With that, she gently stroked my thigh. I bought her a beer, and we found a table in the corner, next to the pool tables where the girls were playing. While we were talking, I found out that the old band still meets on weekends, and even June takes part in the fun. Terry didn't say anything about her ex's current whereabouts, and I knew it wasn't my business. But the longer we talked, the more I realized that I wanted to spend the evening with her. We went to my house. Eventually we got down to business and fell asleep a few hours later. Since she didn't have a job the next morning, I let her relax in bed and spend time with me. Josh, I know we're not looking for a serious relationship, but I thought it would be nice to have casual relationships from time to time. Do you mind? After everything went well last night and this morning, I think it might work. I don't mind, as long as neither of us starts a serious relationship. Sandra called me the same day and said she would be back home on Thursday afternoon and evening, unless she had to leave for a sudden delivery. This call made my day really happy. I contacted a friend in Sevierville, and after reading his letter, I realized that Sandra would only benefit if she accepted his offer. When I returned home that evening, the house was in chaos. Terry was in the house, as I advised in the morning, and by lunchtime, June and my mother came to me on a far-fetched pretext. It wasn't the first time she'd done this. She always had a list of excuses ready, otherwise my mom might have come for other reasons. It was obvious that Terry was here for a reason, regardless of my presence. June seemed disoriented by the unexpected appearance of another woman in the place where her house once was. But despite my mom's attempts to act as a mediator, the two seemed to have a fight. Fortunately, apart from disheveled hair and smeared makeup, no one was seriously injured. The pot with the plant was overturned, but the physical damage was not limited to this. Half an hour later, mom, dad, and June drove up to the house. While I was waiting for them to come in, I broke my neck. Mom spoke first. Josh, I do not know what kind of household you run, but allowing tramps to come and go at any time is unacceptable. The father remained silent, realizing that it was better not to interfere. I looked at June, and then back at Mom, looking at her questioningly. So how old am I, Mom? You're 30, she replied. And how long have I been living on my own? Since you turned 19, I think, she replied. That's right, since I was 19, I confirmed. And I've been living in this house since I was 24, right? She nodded in confirmation. Am I a married man, Mom? Well, you were and you should be, she replied. I interjected. I was really married before, but not now. Do you understand? Now let's move on to the next question. Mom, who are these tramps you were talking about? As far as I know, there was only one tramp living in this house, and I found her in bed with another man. So, who are these tramps running around my house I'm interested to know? My mom and June were sitting on the couch in shock and couldn't speak. My father started to say something about not talking to my mother like that, but stopped before she could get into any more trouble, and I continued talking. Let me tell you frankly about some things. In fact, this house belongs to me. At the age of 30, I am not married and do not lead a religious lifestyle, so from time to time I like to have fun in the company. Then June cried out with tears in her eyes, You can always take me with you. I giggled and took another sip of my drink. I replied jokingly, You've already been to my place once and look how it turned out. Having set some boundaries, I firmly stated, Okay. Here's what, I don't want anyone to enter my house when I'm not there. I didn't think about it before, but now everything is clear. If I can't trust you, I'll change the locks. If you don't like my guests, please don't hesitate. Come back another time and we can roast hamburgers together. But if an attractive guest appears in my bachelor apartment, imagine how awkward it would be if my parents tried to interrogate her. I grinned at the three of them. Does anyone want to have a beer? June? You too. 
My parents took the drinks and took the cold chicken out of the fridge. I took June to my workshop. There's no reason for you to come to my house and criticize the people I talk to or any other aspect of my life, June. Absolutely none. I know you're having fun with someone else right now. Why is it acceptable for you to have fun with another man? But you're angry if Susie Q, Jill on the Hill, and even Terry gets the affection you threw away for that jerk Charlie? You created this situation, June, not me. I do not know who you are in a relationship with right now. And to be honest, I am not interested. I don't care. So it all comes down to this. It's time to start behaving respectfully and moving forward in life. Please stop trying to involve my parents in our problems. I know they care about you and you care about them, but it's important not to involve Terry. She didn't hurt you, and neither did I. When she looked at the ground, I could see the pain in her eyes. Despite her love for me, she continued to betray me while claiming that she wanted me back. When we returned to the house, mom and dad were relaxing in armchairs, absorbed in an old TV show. After everyone left, I was finally able to relax, except for the upcoming phone call from Terry, which I had to answer to apologize for the chaotic family meeting. The next day, while I was having lunch at a local diner, June Ann's sister joined me at my booth. Hi, Josh. You look as attractive as ever, she greeted me warmly. I have always admired Anne and her kindness, as I mentioned earlier. During our conversation, June shared with me the details of the events of the previous day. I think she understood everything, Josh, really. I'm upset about how things turned out, and you know how I feel about it. If you weren't my brother-in-law, and you always will be, I would protect you myself. I'll do my best to steer her in a different direction and see how things go. But it seems like everything you said resonated with her because she told me she plans to move on. I'm glad to hear that, Anne. And I appreciate your support. I've always had feelings for her, but I won't be able to forgive her actions. Yes, she is aware of it. She's been fixated on that terrible guy she's been with since you first met. But I think she realizes now that she lost everything because of him. I just nodded, and we continued our conversation until she had to leave for work. I paid the bill and went to the mountains to get to Tennessee. Sandra was in the garden when I arrived at her place on Thursday, and her dogs, as usual, notified me of my presence. It was incredibly hot that day, and she was dressed appropriately very short jeans and a tight t-shirt and nothing else. I tried my best not to look at her visibly strained form under the thin fabric. She willingly hugged me before we headed into the house to prepare a treat. My babies adore you, she said, pointing to the puffing dogs resting on the kitchen floor. I wish they'd told me about it themselves, I grumbled. She poured herself an iced tea and handed me a cold beer. While we were discussing the specifics of selling her car collection, time flew by quickly. My friend from Sevierville offered to put them up for auction with an 8% commission and a guarantee of $65,000 per lot. Considering the state they were in, I think it was a fair deal, Sandra agreed. Having settled all the details, we relaxed on the veranda, sipping drinks in the afternoon sun. Do you want to swim? Sandra asked with a mischievous smile. Dad widened and deepened the pool a couple of years ago, and on such a hot day, it's just perfect. I forgot my swimming trunks. You won't need them. There's no one here, she said. I assured myself that I was not shy about women and that I had no figure flaws and agreed with a smile. We took beer and towels and went to the back area. When we arrived, Sandra wasted no time taking off her shorts and top, threw them on a nearby branch and dived into a pond washed by a stream. I hesitated for a moment, but then I shrugged and started to undress. Finding myself as naked as Sandra, I followed her example and jumped into the pond, entering the water up to my shoulders. I plunged into the pond until the water reached my shoulders. Sandra was standing next to me, her face glowing with happiness. This place evoked nostalgic memories from my childhood, when my grandmother lived here. We splashed in the water to cool off on hot days and I remembered it for a long time. I remember the boys from the next road who tried to spy on us until my grandmother asked her dog to stand guard. In those days, 
The nearest place to swim was Jonathan Creek, where the water was always too cool for comfort. After diving into the water, I swam for a while until I was next to Sandra. When I surfaced, our faces were a few centimeters apart, and I looked into her sparkling blue eyes. The next moment she hugged me and said, I like you, Josh Sutton, I really like you. She looked up at me when I confessed, I fell in love with you like a schoolboy from the moment we first met. Her answer was simple, okay, you can invite me to dinner tonight. With that, we swam a little more before leaving the pond. After drying off and returning home, we decided to have lunch at Cosby's restaurant. Despite the limited choice of restaurants in Cosby, we were attracted by the magnolia tree and the promise of excellent brisket. We were seated at a cozy table away from the hustle and bustle, and I realized that I had received one of the best dinners in recent times, and all thanks to the wonderful company of the woman who was sitting next to me. During the conversation, we touched on all imaginable topics, and when the sun began to set, I realized that it was time to accompany her home. It was about 9.30 p.m. when we pulled up to the gravel parking lot. I walked her to the door and kissed her on the lips while her pets, Samson and Della, watched us closely. You don't have to go over there tonight, Josh. I've got the guest room ready for you. I've prepared a guest room for you. Enjoy a hearty breakfast in the morning and leave when you're ready, she offered with an encouraging smile. Her offer was too tempting to resist. I canceled my evening reservation at the hotel and spent the night in her guest room. The next morning she sent me to work, treating me to a delicious rustic breakfast. On Saturday afternoon, we arranged a date and dinner in Gatlinburg. That night, we stayed at the charming bed and breakfast inn in the village. Sandra was different from all the women I had met before, especially June and Terry. She had a sensual nature that captivated me and I couldn't help but think that her ex-husband was a fool when he let her go. After that moment, we started dating and maintained a long-distance relationship, often staying at her house and sometimes driving to Waynesville in Sandra's car. I met her father, who was wary of me at first until Sandra talked to him alone. I do not know what exactly she said, but after that he was always friendly with me. On a beautiful Saturday morning while fishing on Big Creek, I decided to make an important decision in my life. As soon as this thought occurred to me, the line on my fly fishing rod suddenly tightened, causing the reel to jerk and the line to chase after it until I managed to catch it with my thumb, which served as the signal for the beginning of an exciting struggle. After a few minutes of excitement, I hooked a hefty one and a half pound trout, which was a positive omen and confirmation that everything was going smoothly in my life. Later in the afternoon, Sandra and I returned to Waynesville and decided to spend the evening in Asheville. We ended up in a dance hall on Patton, a familiar place where I often spent evenings with my friendly group of friends. Due to my new relationship with Sandra, I didn't see my friends that often, including my friend Terry. But by the will of fate, I ran into them that evening. Terry was there with her new partner, as well as some familiar faces from our past, including colleagues from the hospital where Terry and June were still working. I noticed Terry at the other end of the room, surrounded by old friends and acquaintances. June seemed pleased with the company of a man I didn't know. Even though she was trying to move forward with her life, she still found time to apologize for the fact that our marriage had broken up. My parents continued to accept her as a member of the family, which, as it seemed to me, did not touch me at all. June didn't know that Sandra and I were in a serious relationship, and it was the first time she saw us together. Sandra and I were dancing and chatting at the bar when June came up behind me. Hello, stranger, she greeted me when I turned to face her. Hello, June. You look great, I said, looking around the room for her companion. You're Josh, too. Your parents told me you're doing well in Tennessee. I am sincerely happy for you. I introduced her to Sandra, noticing the notes of sadness in her eyes, which she skillfully hid. We exchanged a light hug, after which she returned to her company. Suddenly, I felt a sharp blow to the head which made Sandra scream, No, Bill, don't do that! But it was already too late. 
He swung at me again, and I hit back with my right, knocking him to the ground. Sandra started crying, and June suddenly rushed to help the man lying on the ground. Jesus, Josh, what were you thinking? June exclaimed. I stared at her, trying to understand the situation. But then it dawned on me that this man was actually her companion. June explained that he was the one who attacked me, and not the other way around, as she had thought before. The bouncers immediately escorted him out of the hall, and June went to the bathroom to recover. Sandra and I returned to the bar, where two fresh drinks were waiting for us, courtesy of the establishment. Sandra revealed that she has a restraining order against Bill because he is unstable. I nodded in agreement, trying to put my anxious thoughts aside. This incident ruined our evening, but when we were about to leave, June came up to us again. Sandra explained who he was and what he did, and June almost burst into tears. Since he was her traveling companion, she was left without a car. We decided to take her to Anne's sister's house. As we were leaving, June stopped to say goodbye to someone. Sandra and I headed for the parking lot, and June followed. Suddenly I saw a bright flash and heard a loud bang in front of me. I reacted quickly and fell to the ground. Billy Dresser fell backwards. I quickly checked myself for damage but felt nothing, deciding that the drunken brawler had only hit me. Suddenly Sandra let out a startled scream. I turned around and saw June lying on the ground. While the house guards were rushing to the scene, I knelt down next to her and saw that she was still breathing, barely regaining consciousness. Time seemed to freeze, as if I was watching the unfolding events from the sidelines. The woman asked me to get out of the way and began to provide first aid. After a few minutes which seemed like a moment to me, but were actually a few minutes, an ambulance doctor arrived and took over everything. June was taken to the hospital, and we followed her. It occurred to me to contact Anne to inform her of the situation and ask her to join us at the hospital. When Anne arrived, June had already been taken to the operating room. We sat anxiously in the operating room and waited for news. After a while, a nurse appeared and informed us that June was still undergoing surgery. It will be some time before they can report her condition. At that time, her condition remained critical. I left Sandra and Anne to go get some food, and when I returned, I found them standing by the window with their hands clasped. Anne looked confused, but after we managed to cram some food into her, we all gathered nearby to wait for the operation to begin. Three hours later, the doctor appeared to inform us about June's condition. She is currently in the intensive care unit, and apparently, she will be able to survive. The full extent of her injuries will be known only after she wakes up from the artificial coma necessary for the healing of the body. The bullet shattered on impact. Some fragments grazed the medial temporal lobe, which could potentially affect some aspects of her memory. But, apparently, her motor functions were not affected, which was demonstrated during the operation. More detailed information will be provided in the coming days as her condition improves. We were given some time to sit with her, and Sandra and I comforted a distraught Anne. The next day, the doctors gave Anne and her parents the latest news. They matched the information received the day before. June was in an artificial coma for four days. When she finally woke up, Anne and her parents were by her side, and the first person she asked to meet was me. Anne brought me up to date before I visited June at the hospital. Despite a slight opacity in her right eye, which doctors say will improve over time, June has demonstrated good speech and hearing abilities. She has partially lost her memory and does not remember how and where she was shot and by whom. Josh, you have to be ready for this. She thinks she's still married to you, as if nothing has happened in the last few years. She even thinks that you were planning to start a family together. As a result, you may have to postpone these plans for a couple of months. I didn't know what to do next and even thought about going to the hospital. But Sandra, in her wisdom, refused to listen to any suggestions. She escorted me to the hospital but stayed in the hallway while I went upstairs. June looked unwell but she was already awake and resting. Her parents had just left the room and Anne was by her side. 
Without delay, she asked, Josh, where are my wedding rings? I remember putting them on yesterday morning before all this. Anne looked at me with a mournful expression, seeming to expect an answer from me as if I were still her spouse. I didn't know what to do. The thing was, I was in love. The wedding ring was in the dresser in my bedroom, waiting for the moment that I hoped would come in a few days. June, do you know what date or year it is now? I asked quietly. It's probably July of the year 2012, she replied, confused by the doctor's contradictory information. I turned to Anne, who was avoiding my gaze with tears in her eyes. June, don't worry about your rings right now. Your health and possible memory recovery are the top priority, I said, with a slight attempt at a smile, but my worried look overshadowed her. June reached out to take my hand as I sat down, and I accepted the gesture, trying to make sense of the situation. We discussed various topics, including family and recovery. After that, in the waiting room, Anne and I talked to June's doctor about the prospects of her memory. It turned out that she perceives most of her memories, easily recognizes family and friends, but it was difficult for her to piece together dates and events. Some things she couldn't remember, like her infidelity. I asked the doctor if she could restore those memories. The doctor explained that it was difficult to predict, suggesting that memories could be triggered by a certain person or place. The doctor could not tell her how to live on, saying only that it was unknown whether these memories would return to her. In any case, the probability of this was 50-50. The decision was hers, to stay in the same place or maybe take it all back. It was unclear. After expressing my gratitude to the doctor, I hugged Anne warmly. I confessed to her that I had planned to propose to Sandra on the night of the June shoot, but I didn't have time. To my surprise, Anne told me that Sandra had already confessed my intentions to her. It seems I wasn't as secretive as I thought. In fact, I have already made a decision. All that remained was to go downstairs and start acting. The couple rode a Canem Spider F3S along the gravel path near the old house. The wind ruffled their hair and raised a cloud of dust. When we arrived at the bridge over a large stream, we decided to stop for a rest to stretch our legs and try our luck in catching a large brown trout. To our surprise, this elusive fish still swims in those waters to this day. It's been a year since June was injured, and Bill Dresser ended up in jail after our confrontation in Asheville. As a result, I sold my house in Waynesville and got the opportunity to work in the regional office in Cosby, which I did willingly. I rented an extra room at Sandra's farmhouse as my job required day trips. Although I still had to work at night, it was quite possible. Sandra and I, who works as a midwife almost full-time, even took a two-week vacation last May to soak up the sun together in Key West. After a rejuvenating vacation, we returned tanned, rested, and ready to start a new life together. Reflecting on my past failed marriage, when I took the elevator down to meet Sandra in the hospital lobby a year ago, I realized that I wanted my future to be clear and simple. I have already moved. I didn't understand why I should give up my current happiness for a woman who was still a cheater and a libertine, even if she didn't remember any of it. I know people who drink too much and don't remember anything the next day, but they're still the same people. Anne made it easier for me. She had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with June and did everything she could to help her remember, even enlisting my old rival Charlie, but it didn't work out. After a while, June came to terms with the truth, although she couldn't remember it. In the end, this realization brought her great sadness. She became depressed until my guardian angel intervened. One weekday, Sandra went to Waynesville without my knowledge while I was on a business trip. It was only a few months later that she told me about it. Josh, I had to take action. Put yourself in her shoes and imagine how you would feel if your lover suddenly disappeared without explanation to marry someone else. I can't say for sure how I would react, but I suppose it would be similar to June's reaction. She knew that her husband, or ex-husband, was in love with another woman and intended to marry her. This news was undoubtedly going to be heartbreaking for her, and I sympathize with her pain. 
She acknowledged the reality of the situation and acknowledged that her own actions contributed to her current state of despair. I suggested that she make a decision, either admit the consequences of her actions or continue to live the way she lived before this turmoil began. She had a choice, to move on, and she decided to do it for the sake of our friendship. When we were fishing in a large stream, two more Kama spiders appeared next to us. June and her partner, with whom she has been living for the last six months, joined us in trying to convince the big lurker to try again. Despite the betrayal, the divorce, and the difficulties associated with later life, June and I were able to come out of it all as friends. My parents have also come to terms with the situation and continue to love June, often inviting her to visit with a new partner. They've come to terms with reality, and I adore Sandra as much as I adore June. At the moment, my life is going well, and the only thing I'm worried about is how to accommodate the addition to our family in the limited space of our two-seater Can-Am. Sandra informed me last night that I'm going to be a father soon. And three years later, after June got married, she was still unable to get pregnant. Doctors informed her that she was infertile. Apparently, she doesn't deserve to be a mother. On this beautiful autumn day, the sun was shining brightly, and the promise of a wonderful season was in the air. Walking through the city park, I couldn't help but admire the trees, which were half red, orange, and yellow, and the other half remained bright green. My morning has been perfect so far. I turned 30, and my colleague surprised me by inviting me to lunch, and my boss gave me the day off. After enjoying a delicious meal at the restaurant, I decided not to return to the empty apartment, but to take a leisurely walk. I decided to take a walk in the park and found myself at the intersection of Main and Pine Streets when something caught my attention. There was an amazing floral arrangement in a trash can at the edge of the park. It was not just an ordinary bouquet, but an extravagant mix of red roses, yellow irises, purple larkspur, and four mysterious flowers thrown into a trash can. Amazed, I crossed the street and entered a charming outdoor cafe with two empty tables and a view of the park. I sat down at a table outside, ordered a Campari Negroni, and watched the passers-by near the trash can. Several people looked back at the bouquet, several paused to examine it in more detail. Despite the attention, no one dared to touch the flowers, except for one woman who took a picture on her phone. Leisurely sipping my drink, I noticed a well-dressed man stop briefly and continue on his way. He looked about my age, slightly overweight, and he was about 5 feet 9 inches tall. John Farnsworth's mind began to wander. He couldn't help but admire how well his life had turned out lately. After five years of hard work at the bank, after graduating from university, he was surprised when he was called to the president's office and informed that the board of directors had chosen him for the position of vice president. It almost seemed like a joke to him, but Mr. Jackson was serious. It was a real and exciting opportunity for John. The vice president was only three months short of his 29th birthday, which was a record for his age. According to his administrative assistant, Miss Barnes, who has worked at the bank since its founding in 1999, this was not a small achievement. After leaving Mr. Jackson's office, John made a decision. This day has finally come. He had been in a relationship with Michelle for six months, and for five of those months they had been exceptionally close to each other. They exchanged the words, I love you, shortly before sharing their first intimate moment together. John often couldn't understand how such an amazing, intelligent, and charming woman like Michelle could become his life partner. Not only was she a positive force in his life, but she never complained about long hours at work, was always ready for spontaneous events, and motivated him to strive for greatness. Thanks to her support, he rediscovered his passion for working out at the gym. Over the past six months, John has lost a lot of weight and is now in the best shape since his wrestling days at school. He intends to lose some more weight before buying new suits, as he looks slightly overweight in his current wardrobe. Encouraged by his success, 
John called Michelle and invited her to lunch. He mysteriously said that he had interesting news and needed to ask her a question. Without giving any hints, he asked her to meet him at Sullivan's in the park. I love riddles. And I love you, my dear. Let's meet at noon. John left work at 12.30 p.m., whistling a tune as he passed Miss Barnes at her desk. She couldn't help but smile. He was humming the Beatles song, his mother's favorite song. John looked into the flower shop in the lobby. I need a special bouquet for a special person, he said. With a bouquet in his hands, whistling a cheerful melody, John walked down the street, immersed in his thoughts. He wondered what the future held for him next year, next decade, even the next 50 years. Celebrating his parents' 35th wedding anniversary made an indelible impression on him. He saw how much they loved each other. When he came to a table outside, he saw Michelle sitting there and imagined their future together, a life full of love and children. As John was walking towards the restaurant, Michelle noticed him and waved enthusiastically. Her smile widened when she noticed the large bouquet of flowers in his hand. John was without a doubt the kindest and most generous man she had ever met. He always tried to show her his love, whether it was with small gestures or grandiose displays. John walked over to the table and bent down to kiss Michelle. She reached impatiently for the bouquet, but John teasingly pushed her away. Not yet, he said with a grin and took the seat opposite her. Let me introduce you to the new vice president of the First Bank. Michelle immediately understood the situation. John, this is amazing, she exclaimed, squeezing his hand. I'm very happy for you. Congratulations. Mr. Jackson mentioned that the board of directors wants to express their appreciation to me. Michelle was beaming with joy. That's all the news. And now, the question. At that moment, a waiter came up to their table and asked if John would like a drink. Michelle was already enjoying a glass of white wine. Yes, please bring us a bottle of champagne we're celebrating today, she told the waiter before he left. My boyfriend got some amazing news today. It's not just my promotion we're celebrating. John took the flowers from the table and presented them to Michelle. Later we will choose a ring together. Let this bouquet be a symbol of this. Michelle, will you marry me? Time seemed to stand still as John anxiously waited for Michelle's response. She met his gaze, trying to find the right words to soften the blow. In the end, she could only be honest with him. John, I don't have strong feelings for you. At these words, John's world collapsed in a matter of seconds. He couldn't believe what he had just heard. But you said you love me. We've been sleeping together for four months now. You've always told me how much joy I've brought into your life. What don't I understand? All this is true, John. But I will never be able to love you enough to become your wife. It always seemed to me that I settled down early and did not wait for the right man. As a result, we will be unhappy and eventually get divorced, I'm sure of it. As soon as the words settle down left her mouth, Michelle realized that she had made a mistake. John tried to make sense of Michelle's words. Settled down, unhappy, divorced, never loved you enough. Just last night, she was in his arms, professing her love during their intimacy. It was moments like this that made John believe that they were destined to be together. The chemistry between them was undeniable. When the waiter brought the champagne, John suddenly got up from the table. John took $82 out of his wallet and handed them to the waiter. That should be enough for drinks and your tips. I guess we can return the champagne since it's still sealed, right? John asked. The waiter took the money and nodded, thanking him, not knowing what else to say. It was clear that something had gone wrong. John took the flowers and headed for the exit, leaving the waiter and himself at a loss. John couldn't help but wonder what had gone wrong. Is a simple goodbye enough? Calling her a fool was out of the question. She didn't make any commitments to him. He just assumed that she had the same feelings for him that he had for her. John was already leaving the fenced area when Michelle called out to him. Can I leave the flowers? 
What is it? She asked. No, he replied sharply, crossed the street and threw the bouquet into the trash can along with other discarded items. Fast food bags, soda cans, and a broken umbrella left over from the morning rain. The next day Michelle contacted John and did her best to make peace with him. She asked if it was possible to salvage their friendship for mutual benefit, and suggested that they meet for dinner in the near future. But John's answer remained unchanged. He expressed his belief that their relationship would not progress beyond the current state, and that he needed something more than what Michelle could offer. In his opinion, it is better to end the relationship before she finds someone she really wants to marry. Despite the conversation, they saw each other several times after it. The city was big enough for each of them to live their own lives and never cross paths again. One day, John was in a bar and ran into the husband of Michelle's friend. They always got along well, and John decided to buy him a drink. While they were chatting, John finally plucked up the courage and asked about Michelle. I've always been hesitant to ask her myself. Maybe you have some ideas, John said. When Michelle said she would settle down if she accepted my offer, what did that mean? She was passionate about her idea of Prince Charming. After a pause, he continued, John, we are very similar. We are short, dark-skinned, and beautiful. We're both just average guys, maybe seven or eight out of ten. I am grateful to my wife for loving me the way I am. It's better to find someone who won't pay attention to all the superficial things and will love you for the same reasons. There are many women who look like my Jennifer. During the time I met Michelle I managed to lose weight, but my height will never exceed 5 feet 9 inches. If it makes you feel better, Michelle told Jennifer how much she misses you and talked about your wonderful qualities, and I still couldn't part with the idealized image of the perfect couple. Five years later, John noticed Michelle at an open-air concert. John stood next to his wife as they waited for her bag to be searched. She noticed that he was staring intently at the brunette. Do you know her? He was startled by his wife's voice. Do you remember when I told you about my past refusal of an offer? Yes, is that her? Yes. Do you want to go say hello? No, I'll feel ingratiated. What are you saying? That she rejected me but I went and married you. Most wives would call it a lie. But John's wife knew him well enough to know that he was sincere. He really believed that he had married the most beautiful woman in the world. As she hugged him, she thought about how happy he would be when she told him the news at the hotel that evening. John will become a father. While I was sitting at the table, the waiter came up and asked if I wanted to order another drink. The sun's rays continued to warm me and my glass was empty. Having no immediate obligations, I thought, why not have another drink? Crossing to the other side of the street, I noticed a bright woman admiring a bouquet and stopped before continuing on her way. My imagination was fired up as I watched her, thinking about her story. For the past hour, Alexis Walker from the Northern District has been mulling the idea of starting smoking again. She only quit smoking because her boyfriend, Matt, made it a condition of marriage. Wanting to please him, she used a nicotine patch to get rid of the habit. Strangely enough, Matt could not give up his addiction to flirting. Back in college, it seemed harmless and even funny when their friends were doing it. Their relationship never went beyond dancing, casual kisses, and playful buttocks pats. But as they moved from student life to adulthood, Changes began to occur in their relationship. Their male friends became less tolerant when their wives were groped, and women began to defend themselves when young girls tried to kiss their husbands. Despite these changes, one thing remained unchanged. Alexis and Matt got married in their sophomore year after graduating from university. One of the rare couples whose love lasted until the end of their student years was now facing the inevitable end of their relationship. Alexis sat in a cafe and sipped coffee, fighting the temptation to smoke. She wondered which was more harmful, to treat herself to a large cake or to succumb to the desire to smoke. Earlier in the morning, she met with her lawyer to arrange documents for the upcoming divorce. Sitting on the terrace and sipping decaf coffee, 
she reflected on the bittersweet reality of their impending divorce. Debating whether to approach the man at the next table and ask him for a cigarette, Alexis watched the trees dropping raindrops from their leaves after a morning downpour. She could put up with flirting, but infidelity was a barrier for her. Two years had passed since the beginning of their marriage, when Alexis first caught Matt red-handed with a woman from the other side of the yard. The daring mistress was pacing around the apartment, protected from prying eyes only by thick curtains. The room was lit up, and her silhouette could be seen on the curtains. During the day, she often did not close the curtains, confidently walking around the apartment in the nude. In the pool, she showed off her figure in the most revealing bikinis. And at a party in the courtyard of her complex, she attracted the attention of a man who could not resist her attractiveness. Three months after moving in, she made it clear that she was having an affair with Matt. Matt didn't know that this schemer had set him up. When Alexis confronted him, Matt apologized, made countless promises that it would never happen again, and asked for forgiveness. Bouquets of flowers were delivered weekly to Alexis's apartment and office until she eventually resigned herself. But before she let Matt back into her bed, Alexis insisted that he take a disease test because she wasn't sure about his previous symptoms. After the test turned out to be clean, Alexis allowed Matt to return to their bed. Alexis was well aware of this woman's manipulation tactics. Matt was not distinguished by outstanding abilities in the bedroom. His size and skills were not up to par. But this woman simply needed to prove her superiority by seducing any married man and falsely accusing his wife of infidelity. Despite her doubts, Alexis decided to forgive him. She loved him, but she made it clear that she would not tolerate any indiscretions in the future. She even forced him to sign a prenuptial agreement to protect himself. Matt realized that he had barely managed to avoid a risky situation. It all started with the fact that a blonde entered the courtyard and began to charm him with her actions, forcing him to lose control of himself. Matt had to admit to himself that he was prone to cheating not only with others, but also with himself. This was not the first time he had been seduced by a woman, because many others had attracted his attention in the past. But this blonde was more approachable, and Matt found it hard to resist. A week after moving in, Matt noticed shadows on the curtains. He almost told Alexis about it when they were sitting on the back porch, but instead he didn't say anything and bought better binoculars the next day. Spending more time on the veranda, he watched and waited for the light to come on in the blonde's window. When he had the opportunity, for example, when Alexis was busy in the office, he would sneak inside and watch what was happening from a dimly lit room. Looking through the binoculars, he saw that she was completely naked. After a moment, he noticed that she was lying on the bed. He felt like he was watching his own private show. The big barbecue day was unforgettable, as she always showed off her beauty at every opportunity. Like a fish caught on a hook, Matt was captivated. Despite her best efforts, it took the blonde three attempts to catch Alexis and her husband. After the second session in the bedroom, the blonde was on the verge of giving up. She couldn't understand how this woman could stand such a situation. The first time with Matt was unsuccessful, but at least she wasn't caught. The second attempt was no better, with the same disappointing result. If it weren't for her fierce hatred of Alexis, she would have dropped everything right away. But why did she hate Alexis so much? This feeling arose from the very beginning, as soon as she saw her. Alexis is lucky to have a slim figure and toned legs due to her commitment to a healthy diet and intense physical activity, including running and swimming in the pool. Through her efforts to overcome shyness and introversion, she gained a solid circle of friends, and her husband Matt often expressed gratitude for being married to her. Unfortunately, the blonde and Matt's affair became known during the third meeting in his own bed, which led to an inevitable quarrel. Despite the fact that Matt cheated on her, Alexis eventually forgave him and accepted him back, although it was not an easy decision. It was two weeks before Matt returned to the apartment and more than a month before they were in the same bed again. Over the next year, 
Matt tried hard to prove to Alexis that his infidelity was behind him. Alexis carefully opened her heart to him, forgiving his past actions and trying to forget about the betrayal. Alexis was not surprised when, a little over a year later, she discovered that he was cheating again. What really surprised her was how she found out about it. While Matt was playing golf, the doorbell rang. When she opened the door, she saw a young girl standing on the threshold. Are you Alexis? The girl asked. Alexis confirmed it. She expected the girl to sell cookies for Girl Scouts or some other product, but she was puzzled why the girl was asking her name. Can I talk to you? Alexis hesitated, eyeing the girl for potential danger. She had heard of cases of fraud where someone broke into a house while the tenants were distracted. Seeing no one, she carefully unlocked the door and quickly locked it as soon as the girl entered. How can I help you? Alexis asked, her heart pounding. The girl took a deep breath before speaking. You can let Matt go. Give him a divorce. Alexis was stunned and tried to find her voice. I'm sorry, what? Why do you want me to let Matt go? If you really cared about him, you would put his happiness first and let him move on. I will make sure that he is happy. If Alexis had been a spectator of this situation in a vulgar romantic show, she might have seemed funny and comical. But this was her reality, not a scripted TV drama. Alexis felt emotions boiling inside her, but she remained calm, trying to figure out the situation. Despite her best efforts to remain calm, Alexis couldn't help but ask, How old are you? The girl looked offended by this question but answered reluctantly. Alexis didn't say it out loud, but she couldn't help but think, if she were a year younger, I'd put him away. Wanting to keep up the conversation, Alexis discreetly turned on the dictaphone in her phone. Without hesitation, she offered the girl a glass of wine, but quickly remembered that she was very young. Choosing the safer option, she asked, may I offer you a Coke? The girl named Lacey seemed to be enjoying the conversation. She had expected a tense exchange, judging by the way Matt described Alexis. Alexis returned to the room with a Coke for Lacey and a glass of wine for herself. Twenty minutes later, Alexis lost her patience. Lacey left, and messages from Lacey Brown appeared on Alexis's phone. She said they met at Lacey's job at Tremors, a local imitation of Hooters. Their affair had been going on for two months. Alexis wasn't ready to hear about how amazingly close Lacey and Matt were, but now it was all recorded on a tape recorder. After leaving, Lacey received a message from Alexis, in which she secured a promise that Matt would be free soon. Alexis pulled herself together, packed her bag, and drove to her sister Haley's house. As soon as she arrived, Alexis fell into bed and cried for an hour while Haley comforted her. Haley's heart ached as she listened to Alexis talk about Matt's misdeeds. She hoped Matt would show up at any moment. She was filled with an overwhelming desire to teach him a lesson for the evil he had done to her younger sister. That Sunday my sister turned to a friend, who had recently gone through a divorce. By Monday morning, Alexis had scheduled a meeting with her lawyer for Wednesday. As they left the lawyer's office, she felt a glimmer of hope for the future knowing that justice would soon prevail when Matt was handed the divorce papers on Friday. After finishing her coffee, Alexis got ready to leave, planning to pick up a few more things from home. But when she looked up, she was surprised to see Matt standing in front of her with a large bouquet of flowers. Please come home, Alexis. I'm so sorry, Matt pleaded as Alexis left the cafe and headed across the street. He followed her, desperate to make things right. What can I do to make amends? He asked. Alexis paused, her hand hovering over a bouquet of flowers. Matt held his breath, wondering if she could forgive him again. Without saying a word, Alexis took the flowers, smelled them, and threw them in the trash. You can take your flowers and never talk to me again. Go and experience love with Miss Brown at a boy band concert. Drink a Coke while she shakes her breasts in front of your face. Alexis exhaled deeply. She hailed a taxi and asked to be taken to the garage where her car was parked, generously tipping the taxi driver for a quick ride. Back at her sister's house, 
Alexis quickly changed into a tracksuit and went for a run of several kilometers. When she returned home, she found Kyle's sister and brother-in-law there. Alexis told about the meeting with her lawyer, about the confrontation with her future ex-husband Matt, and that she should receive divorce papers on Friday. Kyle, intrigued, interrupted her. Wait, did Matt show up at the cafe with flowers? How did he know where to look for you? Shocked, Alexis added, Oh my god, I didn't even think about it. Can I take a look at your cell phone? Kyle asked, pressing a few buttons. Do you know that there is a tracking app here? I didn't install it there. Most likely, Matt was trying to make sure that you weren't following him to meet his young mistress, or to see if you were doing something similar to what he was doing to you. That's the trick of deceivers. If they can't be faithful, how can you trust them? While they were talking, Kyle was fiddling with Alexis's phone. Everything is deleted here, he said. On Friday, Matt was handed the divorce papers. Despite this, he tried to call Alexis every day, apologizing for his past actions and promising to be faithful in their future together. Alexis decided not to give him a second chance, as a result of which the divorce was finalized six months later. Before that, Matt's lawyer asked, and the judge assigned the couple three sessions of psychological counseling. These sessions turned out to be useful for Alexis, as she realized that Matt's constant infidelities were not a reflection of her virtues. The root of the problem lay in Matt's low self-esteem, not in his partner's lack of love for her. His tough exterior and manly demeanor were a facade that hid the self-doubt he had developed over the years of bullying by his brother, classmates, and others as a child. His high school sweetheart left him for his best friend shortly after they began a close relationship, which led to Matt's mental trauma. Despite all these difficulties, he eventually found love with Alexis, a woman who was not only stunning in appearance, but also possessed a kind and loving heart. He never realized that he had captured the heart of a wonderful, faithful, and gentle woman, which led to their inevitable breakup because of his own behavior. If only Matt had been faithful to Alexis, they would still be happily married. A year later, after the official divorce, Alexis never picked up that first cigarette. One afternoon, her sister called with an invitation to dinner on Saturday night. Dress casually but elegantly, I want to introduce you to a colleague from the bank, she said. His name is John, you should meet him. He's unique, and you'll love his company. He is smart, experienced, and humble. Sounds like the perfect combination of a great personality, right? Alexis laughed at the description, but decided to give it a try. The dinner party went well, and Alexis happily agreed to John's offer to go to the show and dinner next weekend. When John appeared at her door with a bouquet of autumn asters, Alexis realized that a special evening was waiting for her. Alexis met John at the door in a stunning aqua dress and towering 10-centimeter heels. When John entered the house, he couldn't help but admire Alexis's stunning blue eyes. You look amazing, he complimented. Alexis gracefully accepted the bouquet he brought and with her other hand playfully adjusted John's lapel. And you look very smart yourself, she replied. As she put the flowers in the water, John couldn't help but admire the way the dress accentuated her curves. And what outstanding legs, he thought to himself, almost embarrassed by his thoughts. When John was helping Alexis put on her coat, she quickly mentioned, I'm wearing heels, won't that be a problem? John was taken aback by this question and wondered if she was trying to cancel their date. He wondered if she had changed her mind about dating him now that they were face to face. But she reassured him, does it bother you that I'm taller than you? I'm sorry to ask, but I recently dated a guy about your height, and he asked me to wear ballet flats. I didn't mean to be rude, it's just that it's hard for me to go on dates. My sister can confirm this. John giggled, but couldn't shake the feeling that the situation was getting even more awkward. The whole situation seemed completely ridiculous. Alexis blushed and nodded eagerly. Let's go before we're too late, she suggested. John took her by the hand and escorted her to his car, kindly holding the door for her. 
As he drove through the city center, he looked back at Alexis. Do you mind dating someone my height? Especially with someone who will admire how amazing your feet look in these heels. Alexis suddenly understood why her sister was so insistent on meeting him. John was not only direct and confident, but also humble and respectful. My ex-husband was not particularly tall and was a schemer and a jerk. You seem like a wonderful person. I appreciate it, John said. Unfortunately, my height was not enough for my previous lover. She wanted someone taller. She seems to be as stupid as my ex. Maybe we should bring them together. Only if we make sure they don't have children. There are enough stupid personalities in the world as it is. As John got to know this woman, he developed feelings for her. During the dinner after the show, John talked about his unsuccessful marriage proposal. Alexis comforted him by squeezing his hand and assuring him that it was better to find out the truth before the wedding. Reflecting on her own experience, Alexis said that after three years of a relationship, she realized that her husband was not confident in himself and was constantly looking for confirmation, especially in the intimate sphere. After his second betrayal, she decided it was better to end the relationship and move on. At the age of 24, I got divorced. Since then, I've been on dates with four different men, but my social awkwardness almost ruined the best date of my life with a stupid remark about my heels. Can you find the strength in your heart to forgive me? When John held out his hand to Alexis, he couldn't believe that this beautiful woman with such a kind heart was asking for his forgiveness. Looking into his eyes, Alexis somehow realized that this was the man she would marry. We planned to start a family and grow old together. It was the beginning of a wonderful partnership. Seven months later, on a spring evening, John proposed to Alexis. Alexis readily accepted the offer, wrapping her arms around John's neck and sealing them with a passionate kiss. Two months later, the district judge held a cozy wedding ceremony for Alexis and John Farnsworth on the lawn of his parents' house. After the children were born, they lived happily ever after.